Chapter 11 The shadow market had operated along the banks of the Avery for as long as Riftfold had existed, maybe longer. Legend claimed it had been built on the bones of a god of truth so that it would keep the vendors and would-be thieves honest. Kael supposed it was ironic considering there was no god of truth, as far as he knew. Contraband, illicit substances, spices, clothes, flesh, the market catered to any and all clientele, if they were brave or foolish or desperate enough to venture inside. When he'd first come here weeks ago, Kale had been all of those things as he climbed down the half-rotted wooden stairs from a crumbling section of the docks into the embankment itself, where alcoves and tunnels and shops were tunneled into the riverbank. Cloaked armed figures patrolled the long, broad quay that served as the only path to the market. During rainy periods, the Avery would often rise high enough to flood the quay, and sometimes unlucky merchants and shoppers drowned inside the labyrinths of the shadow market. During drier months, you never knew what or who you might find selling their wares or meandering through the dirty, damp tunnels. The market was packed tonight, even after a day of rain, a small relief, and another small relief as thunder reverberated through the subterranean warrens, setting everyone murmuring. The vendors and lowlifes would be too busy preparing for the storm to take notice of Kaol and Nezrin as they strode down one of the main passageways. The thunder rattled the hanging lanterns of colored glass, strangely beautiful, as if someone had been determined to give this place some loveliness, that served as the main lights in the brown caverns, casting plenty of those shadows the market was so notorious for. Shadows for dark dealings, shadows to slip a knife between the ribs or spirit someone away, or for conspirators to meet. No one had bothered them as they slipped through one of the rough holes that served as an entrance to the shadow market's tunnels. They connected to the sewers somewhere, and he would bet that the more established vendors possessed their own secret exits beneath their stalls or shops. Vendor after vendor had set up stalls of wood or stone with some wares displayed on tables or crates or in baskets, but most valuable goods hidden. A spice dealer offered everything from saffron to cinnamon, but even the most fragrant spices couldn't conceal the cloyingly sweet stench of the opium stash beneath his displays. Once, long ago, Kale might have cared about the illegal substances, about the vendors selling whatever they pleased. He might have bothered to try and shut this place down. Now they were nothing but resources. As a city guard, Nezrin probably felt the same way. Even if, just by being here, she was jeopardizing her own safety. This was a neutral zone, but its Denzians didn't take kindly to authority. He didn't blame them. The Shadow Market had been one of the first places the King of Adarlan had purged after magic vanished, seeking out vendors who claimed to have banned books or still working charms and potions, as well as magic wielders desperate for a cure or a glimmer of magic. The punishments hadn't been pretty. Kale almost heaved a sigh of relief when he spotted the two cloaked figures with a spread of knives for sale at a makeshift stand tucked into the dark corner, exactly where they'd planned, and they'd done a hell of a job making it look authentic. Nezrin slowed her steps pausing at various vendors, no more than a board shopper killing time until the rain ceased. Kael kept close to her, his weapons and prowling gait enough to deter any foolish pickpockets from trying their luck. The punch he'd taken to his ribs earlier that night made maintaining his crawling pace and scowl all the easier. He and a few others had interrupted a valg commander in the midst of dragging a young man to, into the tunnels, and Kael had been so damn distracted by Dorian, by what Aelin had said and done, that he'd been sloppy. So he'd earned that blow to the ribs, and the painful reminder of it each time he drew breath. No distractions, no slip-ups, not when there was so much to do. At last, Kale and Nezrin paused by the little stall, staring down at the dozen knives and short swords displayed across the threadbare blanket. This place is even more depraved than the rumor suggested, Brulo said from the shadows of his hood. I feel like I should cover poor Ress's eyes in half these chambers. Ress chuckled. I'm nineteen, old man. Nothing here surprises me. Ress glanced at Nezrin, who was fingering one of the curved blades. Apologies, lady. I'm 22, she said flatly, and I think we city guards see a great deal more than you palace princesses. What Kael could see of Ress's face flushed. He could have sworn even Brulo was smiling, and for a moment he couldn't breathe under the crushing weight that pushed in on him. There had been a time when this teasing was normal, when he'd sat in public with his men and laughed, when he hadn't been two days away from unleashing hell on the castle that had once been his home. Any news, he managed to say to Brulo, who was watching him too closely, as if his old mentor could see the agony ripping through him. We got the layout of the party this morning, Brulo said tightly. Kale picked up a blade as Brulo reached into the pocket of his cloak. He made a good show of examining the dagger, then holding up a few fingers as if haggling for it. Brulo went on. The new captain of the guard spread us all out, none of us in the great hall itself. The weapons master held up his own fingers, leaning forward, and Kale shrugged, reaching into his cloak for the coins. You think he suspects anything? Kale said, handing over the coins. 
Nezrin closed in, blocking any outside view as Kale's hand met Brulo's and coppers crunched against paper. The small folded maps were in Kale's pocket before anyone noticed. No, Ress answered. The bastard just wants to demean us. He probably thinks some of us are loyal to you, but we'd be dead if he suspected any of us in particular. Be careful, Kale said. He sensed Nezrin tensing a heartbeat before another female voice drawled. Three coppers for a Xandrian blade? If I'd known there was a sale happening, I would have brought more money. Every muscle in Kale's body locked up as he discovered Aelin now standing at Nezrin's side. Of course. Of course she tracked them here. Holy gods, Ress breathed. Beneath the shadows of her dark hood, Aelin's grin was nothing short of wicked. Hello, Ress. Brulo. Sorry to see your palace jobs aren't paying you well enough these days. The weapons master was glancing between her and the passageways. You didn't say she was back, he said to Kaol. Aelin clicked her tongue. Kaol, it seems, likes to keep information to himself. He clenched his fists at his sides. You're drawing too much attention to us. Am I? Aelin lifted a dagger, weighing it in her hands with expert ease. I need to talk to Brulo and my old friend Ress. Since you refused to let me come the other night, this was the only way. So typical of her. Nezrin had taken a casual step away, monitoring the carved tunnels, or avoiding the queen. Queen. The word struck him again. A queen of the realm was in the shadow market, in head-to-toe black, and looking more than happy to start slitting throats. He hadn't been wrong to fear her reunion with Aiden, what they might do together, and if she had her magic. Take off your hood, Brulo said quietly. Aelin looked up. Why? And no. I want to see your face. Aelin went still. But Nezrin turned back and leaned a hand on the table. I saw her face last night, Brulo, and it's as pretty as before. Don't you have a wife to ogle anyway? Aelin snorted. I think I rather like you, Nezrin Felique. Nezrin gave Aelin a half-smile, practically beaming coming from her. Kael wondered whether Aelin would like Nezrin if she knew about their history, or whether the queen would even care. Aelin tugged back her hood only far enough for the light to hit her face. She winked at Ress, who grinned. I missed you, friend, she said. Color stained Ress's cheeks. Brulo's mouth tightened as Aelin looked at him again. For a moment, the weapons master studied her. Then he murmured, I see. The queen stiffened almost imperceptibly. Brulo bowed his head ever so slightly. You're going to rescue Aiden. Aelin pulled her hood into place and inclined her head in confirmation, the swaggering assassin incarnate. I am. Ress swore filthily under his breath. Aelin leaned closer to Brulo. I know I'm asking a great deal of you. Then don't ask it, Kale snapped. Don't endanger them. They risk enough. That's not your call to make, she said. Like hell it wasn't. If they're discovered, we lose our inside source of information, not to mention their lives. What do you plan to do about Dorian? Or is it only Aiden you care about? They were all watching far too closely. Her nostrils flared, but Brulo said, What is it you require of us, lady? Oh, the weapons master definitely knew then. He must have seen Aiden recently enough to have recognized those eyes, that face, and coloring, the moment she pulled back her hood. Perhaps he had suspected it for months now. Aelin said softly, don't let your men be stationed at the southern wall of the gardens. Kaol blinked. Not a request or an order, but a warning. Brulo's voice was slightly hoarse as he said, Anywhere else we should avoid? She was already backing away, shaking her head as if she were our disinterested buyer. Just tell your men to pin a red flower on their uniforms. If anyone asks, say it's to honor the prince on his birthday, but wear them where they can easily be seen. Kaol glanced at her hands. Her dark gloves were clean. How much blood would stain them in a few days? Ress loosed a breath and said to her, Thank you. It wasn't until she'd vanished into the crowd with a jaunty swagger that Kael realized thanks were indeed in order. Aelin Galathinius was about to turn the glass palace into a killing field, and Ress, Brulo, and his men had all been spared. She still hadn't said anything about Dorian, about whether he would be spared or saved. Aelin had known she had eyes on her from the moment she'd left the shadow market after finishing some shopping of her own. She strode right into the Royal Bank of Adarlan anyway. She had business to attend to, and though they'd been minutes away from closing for the day, the Master of Bank had been more than happy to assist her with her inquiries. He never once questioned the fake name her accounts were under. As the Master talked about her various accounts and the interest they'd gather over the years, she took in the details of his office, thick oak-paneled walls pictured that had revealed no hidey holes in the bare minute that she'd had to snoop while he summoned his secretary to bring in tea, and ornate furniture that cost more than most citizens in Rifthold made in a lifetime, including a gorgeous mahogany armoire where most of his wealthiest client's files, including hers, were kept, locked up with a little gold key he kept on his desk. She'd risen as he again scuttled through the double doors of his office to withdraw the sum of money she would take with her that night. 
While he was in the anteroom, giving the order to his secretary, Aelin had casually made her way over to his desk, surveying the papers stacked and strewn about, the various gifts from clients, keys, and a little portrait of a woman who could be either a wife or a daughter. With men like him, it was impossible to tell. He'd returned just as she casually slid a hand into the pocket of her cloak. She made small talk about the weather until the secretary appeared, a little box in hand. Dumping the contents into her coin purse with as much grace as she could muster, Aelin had thanked the secretary and master and breezed out of the office. She took side streets and alleys, ignoring the stench of rotting flesh that even the rain couldn't conceal. Two, she counted two butchering blocks in once pleasant city squares. The bodies left for the crows had been mere shadows against the pale stone walls where they'd been nailed. Aelin wouldn't risk capturing one of the Valg until after Aiden was saved, if she made it out alive, but that didn't mean she couldn't get a head start on it. A chill fog had blanketed the world the night before, seeping in through every nook and cranny. Nestled under layers of quilts and down blankets, Aelin rolled over in bed and stretched a hand across the mattress, reaching lazily for the warm male body beside hers. Cold, silken sheets slid against her fingers. She opened an eye. This wasn't Wendelin. The luxurious bed bedecked in shades of cream and beige belonged in her apartment in Rifthold, and the other half of the bed was neatly made, its pillows and blankets undisturbed, empty. For a moment she could see Rowan there, that harsh, unforgiving face softened into handsomeness by sleep, his silver hair glimmering in the morning light, so stark against the tattoo stretching from his left temple down his neck, over his shoulder, all the way to his fingertips. Aelin loosed a tight breath, rubbing her eyes. Dreaming was bad enough. She would not waste energy missing him, wishing he were here to talk everything through, or to just have the comfort of waking up beside him and knowing he existed. She swallowed hard, her body too heavy as she rose from the bed. She had told herself once that it wasn't a weakness to need Rowan's help, to want his help, and that perhaps there was a kind of strength in acknowledging that, but he wasn't a crutch, and she never wanted him to become one. Still, as she downed her cold breakfast, she wished she hadn't felt such a strong need to prove that to herself weeks ago, especially when word arrived via urchin banging on the warehouse door that she'd been summoned to the assassin's keep immediately. Chapter 12 An emotionless guard delivered the duke's summons, and Manon, who had been about to take a Braxos for a solo ride, ground her teeth for a good five minutes as she paced the airy floor. She was not a dog to be called for, and neither were her witches. Humans were for sport and blood and the occasional, very rare, siring of witchlings. Never commanders, never superiors. Manon stormed down from the airy, and as she hit the base of the tower stairs, Aster and fell into step behind her. I was just coming to get you, her second murmured, her golden hair braid bouncing. The duke... I know what the duke wants, Manon snapped, her iron teeth out. Astrin lifted an eyebrow, but kept silent. Manon checked her growing inclination to start eviscerating. The duke summoned her endlessly for meetings with the tall, thin man who called himself Vernon and who looked at Manon with not nearly enough fear and respect. She could hardly get in a few hours of training with the Thirteen, let alone be airborne for long periods of time without being called for. She breathed in through her nose and out of her mouth, again and again, until she could retract her teeth and nails. Not a dog, but not a brash fool either. She was wing leader and had been heir of the clan for a hundred years. She could handle this mortal pig who would be worm food in a few decades, and then she could return to her glorious, wicked, immortal existence. Manon flung open the doors to the duke's council room, earning her a glance from the guards posted outside, a glance that held no reaction, no emotion, human in shape, but nothing more. The duke was studying a giant map spread across his table, his companion or advisor or jester, Lord Vernon Walklin, standing at his side, down a few seats, staring at the dark glass surface, sat Keltane, unmoving except for the flutter of her white throat as she breathed. The brutal scar on her arm had somehow darkened into a purplish red. Fascinating. What do you want? Manon demanded. Astrin took up her place by the door, arms crossed. The Duke pointed to the chair across from him. We have matters to discuss. Manon remained standing. My mount is hungry, and so am I. I suggest telling me swiftly so I can get on with my hunt. Lord Vernon, dark-haired, slim as a reed, and clothed in bright blue tunic that was far too clean, looked Manon over. Manon bared her teeth at him in silent warning. Vernon just smiled and said, "'What's wrong with the food we provide, lady?' Manon's iron teeth slid down. "'I don't eat food made by mortals, and neither does my mount.' The duke at last lifted his head. "'Had I known you'd be so picky, I would have asked the yellow legs heir to be made wing leader.' Manon casually flicked her nails out. I think you'd find Isk or Yellowlegs to be undisciplined, difficult, and a useless wing leader. Vernon slid into a chair. 
I've heard about the rivalry between witch clans. Got something against the yellow legs, Manon? Astrin let out a low growl at the informal address. You mortals have your rabble, Manon said. We have the yellow legs. What an elitist, Vernon muttered to the duke, who snorted. A line of cold flame went down Manon's spine. You have five minutes, duke. Parrington wrapped his knuckles on the glass table. We are to begin experimenting? As we look into the future, we have to expand our numbers to improve the soldiers we already have. You witches, with your history, allow us to, a chance to do just that. Explain. I am not in the business of explaining every last detail of my plans, the duke said. All I need you to do is give me a Blackbeak coven under your command to test. Test how? To determine whether they are compatible for breeding with our allies from another realm. The Valg. Everything stopped. The man had to be mad, but... Not breed as humans do, of course. It would be an easy, relatively painless procedure, a bit of stone soon just beneath the belly button. The stone allows them in, you see, and a child born of Valg and witch bloodlines? You can understand what an investment that would be. You witches value your offspring so ardently. Both men were smiling blandly, waiting for her acceptance. The Valg, the demons that had bred with Fae to create the witches, somehow returned, and in contact with the Duke and the King, she shut down the questions. You have thousands of humans here. Use them. Most are not innately gifted with magic, and compatible with the Valg as you witches are, and only witches have Valg blood already flowing in their veins. Did her grandmother know of this? We are to be your army, not your whores, Manon said with lethal quiet. Astrin came up to her side, her face tight and pale. Pick a coven of black beaks, was the duke's only reply. I want them ready in a week. Interfere with this wing leader, and I'll make dog meat of your precious mount. Perhaps do the same for your thirteen. You touch Abraxos, and I'll peel the skin from your bones. The duke went back to his map and waved a hand. Dismissed. Oh, and go down to the aerial blacksmith. He sent word that your latest batch of blades are ready for inspection. Manon stood there, calculating the weight of the black glass table, if she could flip it over and use the shards to slowly, deeply cut up both men. Vernon flicked his brows up in a silent, taunting move, and it was enough to send Manon turning away, out the door before she could do something truly stupid. They were halfway to her room when Astrin said, What are you going to do? Manon didn't know, and she couldn't ask her grandmother, not without looking unsure or incapable of following orders. I'll figure it out. But you're not going to give a black beak coven over to them for this breeding. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't be bad to join their bloodline with the Valg. Maybe it'd make their forces stronger. Maybe the Valg would know how to break the croaking curse. Astrin grabbed her by the elbow, nails digging in. Manon blinked at the touch, at the outright demand in it. Never before had Astrin even come close to, You cannot allow this to happen, Astrin said. I've had enough of your orders for one day. You give me another, and you'll find your tongue on the floor. Astrin's face went splotchy. Witchlings are sacred. Sacred, Manon. We do not give them away, not even to other clans. It was true. Witchlings were so rare, and all of them female, as a gift from the three-faced goddess. They were sacred from the moment the mother showed the first signs of pregnancy to when they came of age at sixteen. To harm a pregnant witch, to harm her unborn witchling or her daughter, was a breach of code so profound that there was no amount of suffering that could be inflicted upon the perpetrator to match the heinousness of the crime. Manon herself had participated in the long, long executions twice now, and the punishment had never seemed enough. Human children didn't count. Human children were as good as veal to some of the clans, especially the yellow legs. But witchlings, there was no greater pride than to bear a witch child for your clan, and no greater shame than to lose one. Astrin said, What coven would you pick? I haven't decided. Perhaps you'd pick a lesser coven, just in case, before allowing a more powerful one to join with the Valg. Maybe the demons would give their dying race the shot of vitality they had so desperately needed for the past few decades. Centuries. And if they object? Manon hit the stairs to her personal tower. The only person who objects to anything these days, Astrin, is you. It's not right. Manon sliced out with a hand, tearing through the fabric and skin right above Astrin's breast. I'm replacing you with Sorrel. Astrin didn't touch the blood pooling down her tunic. Manon began walking again. I warned you the other day to stand down, and since you've chosen to ignore me, I have no use for you in those meetings, or at my back. Never, not once in the past hundred years, has she changed their rankings. As of right now, you are third. Should you prove yourself to possess a shred of control, I'll reconsider. Lady, Astrin said softly. Manon pointed to the stairs behind. You get to be the one to tell the others. Now. Manon, Astrin said, a plea in her voice that Manon had never heard before. Manon kept walking, her red cloak stifling in the stairwell. 
She did not particularly care to hear what Astrin had to say, not when her grandmother had made it clear that any step out of line, any disobedience, would earn them all a brutal and swift execution. The cloak around her would never allow her to forget it. I'll see you at the airy in an hour, Manon said, not bothering to look back as she entered her tower and smelled the human inside. The young servant knelt before the fireplace, a brush and dustpan in her hands. She was trembling only slightly, but the tang of her fear had already coated the room. She'd likely been panicked from the moment she set foot inside the chamber. The girl ducked her head, her sheet of midnight hair sliding over her pale face, but not before Manon caught the flash of assessment in her dark eyes. "'What are you doing in here?' Manon said flatly, her iron nails clicking against each other, just to see what the girl would do. C c cleaning the girl stammered too brokenly too perfectly subservient docile and terrified exactly the way the witches preferred only the scent of fear was real manon retracted her iron teeth the servant eased to her feet wincing in pain she shifted enough that the threadbare homespun skirts of her dress swayed revealing the thick chain between her ankles the right ankle was mangled her foot twisted on its side glossy with scar tissue manon hid her predator's smile why would they give me a cripple for a servant? I, I only follow orders. The voice was watery, unremarkable. Manon snorted and headed for the nightstand, her braid and blood-red coke flowing behind her. Slowly, listening, she poured herself some water. The servant gathered her supplies quickly and deftly. I can come back when it won't disturb you, lady. Do your work, mortal, then be gone. Manon turned to watch the girl finish. The servant limped through the room, meek and breakable and unworthy of a second glance. Who did that to your leg? Manon asked, leaning against the bedpost. The servant didn't even lift her head. It was an accident. She gathered the ashes into a pail. She lugged up here. I fell down a flight of stairs when I was eight, and there was nothing to be done. My uncle didn't trust healers enough to let them into our home. I was uh, lucky to keep it. Why the chains? Another flat, bored question. So I couldn't ever run away? You would never have gotten far in these mountains anyway. There, the slight stiffening in her thin shoulders, the valiant effort to hide it. Yes, the girl said, but I grew up in Paranth, not here. She stacked the logs she must have hauled in, limping more with every step. The trek down, hauling the heavy pail of ashes, would be another misery, no doubt. If you need of me, just call for a lead. The guards will know where to find me. Manon watched every simple, limping step she took toward the door. Manon almost let her out, let her think she was free, before she said, no one ever punished your uncle for his stupidity about the healers? Elid looked over her shoulder. He's lord of Paranth. No one could. Vernon Loken is your uncle? Elid nodded. Manon cocked her head, assessing that gentle demeanor, so carefully constructed. Why did your uncle come here? I don't know, Elid breathed. Why bring you here? I don't know, she said again, setting down the pail. She shifted, leaning her weight onto her good leg. Manon said too softly, And who assigned you this room? She almost laughed when the girl's shoulders curved in, when she lowered her head farther. I'm not, not a spy. I swear it on my life. Your life means nothing to me, Manon said, pushing off the bedpost and prowling closer. The servant held her ground, so convincing in her role of submissive human. Manon poked an iron-tipped nail beneath the leech's chin, tilting her head up. If I catch you spying on me, Elid Lachlan, you'll find yourself with two useless legs. The stench of her fear stuffed itself down into Manon's nose. My lady, I, I swear I won't t touch. Leave. Manon sliced her nail underneath Elite's chin, leaving a trickle of blood in its wake. And just because, Manon pulled back and sucked Elite's blood off her iron nail. It was an effort to keep her face blank as she tasted the blood. The truth it told. But Elite had seen enough, it seemed, and the first round of their game was over. Manon let the girl limp out, that heavy chain clinking after her. Manon stared at the empty doorway. It had been amusing at first to let the girl think Manon had been fooled by her cowering, sweet-tongued, harmless act. Then Elide's heritage had been revealed, and Manon's every predatory instinct had kicked in as she monitored the way the girl hid her face so her reactions would be veiled, the way that she told Manon what she wanted to hear, as though she was feeling out a potential enemy. The girl might still be a spy, Manon told herself, turning toward the desk where Elide's scent was strongest. Sure enough, the sprawling map of the continent held traces of Elide's cinnamon and elderberry scent in concentrated spots. Fingerprints. A spy for Vernon, or one with her own agenda? Manon had no idea, but anyone with witch blood in their veins was worth keeping an eye on. Or 13. 
The smoke of countless forges stung Manon's eyes, enough that she blinked her clear eyelid into place and upon landing in the heart of the war camp to the sound of the pounding hammers and crackling flames. Abraxos hissed, pacing in a tight circle that set the dark armored soldiers who'd spotted her landing on edge. They found another place to be when Sorrel landed in the mud beside Manon a moment later, her bowl snarling at the nearest group of onlookers. Abraxos let out a snarl of his own, directed at Sorrel's mount, and Manon gave him a snarl. Abraxos let out a snarl of his own, directed at Sorrel's mount, and Manon gave him a sharp nudge with her heels before dismounting. No fighting, she growled at him, taking in the little clearing amid the roughly built shelters for the blacksmiths. The clearing was reserved for the wyvern riders, complete with deeply rooted posts around its perimeter to tie their mounts. Manon didn't bother, though Sorrel tied up hers, not trusting the creature. Having Sorrel in Astrin's position was strange as if the balance of the world had shifted to one side. Even now their wyverns were skittish around each other, though neither male had yet launched into outright combat. Abraxos usually made space for Astrin's sky-blue female, even brushed up against her. Manon didn't wait for Sorrel to wrangle her bull before striding into the blacksmith's lair, the building little more than a sprawl of wooden posts and makeshift roof. The forges, sleeping giants of stone, provided the light, and around them men hammered and heaved and shoveled and honed. The aerial blacksmith was already waiting just past the first post, gesturing to them with his scarred red hand. On the table before the muscled middle-aged man lay an array of blades, a Darlinian steel, glossy from polishing. Sorrel remained beside Manon as she paused before the spread, picked up a dagger, and weighed it in her hands. Lighter, Manon said to the blacksmith, who watched her with dark, keen eyes. She plucked up another dagger, then a sword, weighing them as well. I need lighter weapons for the covens. The blacksmith's eyes narrowed slightly, but he picked up the sword, she sat down, and weighed it as he had. He cocked his head, tapping the decorated hill and shaking his head. I don't care whether it's pretty, Manon said. There's only one end that matters to me. Cut down on the frills and maybe you'll shave off some weight. He glanced to where Windcleaver peeked over her back, its hilt dull and ordinary, but she'd seen him admire the blade itself, the real masterpiece, when they'd met the other week. Only you mortals care whether the blade looks good, she said. His eyes flashed, and she wondered whether he would have told her off, if he'd had the tongue to do so. Astrin, through whatever way she charmed or terrified people into yielding information, had learned that the man's tongue had been cut out by one of the generals here, to keep him from spilling their secrets. He must not be able to read or write then. Manon wondered what other things they held against him, maybe a family, to keep such a skilled man their prisoner. Perhaps it was because of that, but she said, the wyverns will be bearing enough weight during battle. Between our armor, weapons, supplies, and the wyverns' armor, we need to find places to lighten the load, or else they won't stay airborne for long. The blacksmith braced his hands on his hips, studying the weapons he'd made, and held up a hand to motion her to wait while he hurried deeper into the maze of fire and molten ore and anvils. The strike and clang of metal on metal was the only sound as Sora weighed one of the blades herself. You know I support any decision you make, she said. Sorrel's brown hair was pulled tightly back, her tan face, probably pretty for mortals, steady and solid as ever. But Astrin... Manon stifled a sigh. The Thirteen hadn't dared show any reaction when Manon had taken Sorrel for this visit before the hunt. Vesta had kept close to Astrin in the airy, though, out of solidarity or silent outrage, Manon didn't know. But Astrin had met Manon's stare and nodded, gravely, but she had nodded. "'Do you not want to be second? Manon said. It is an honor to be your second, Sorrel said, her rough voice cutting through the hammers and fires, but it was also an honor to be your third. You know Astrin toes a fine line with wildness on a good day. Stuff her in this castle, tell her she can't kill or maim or hunt, tell her to keep away from the men. She's bound to be on edge. We are all on edge. Manon had told the Thirteen about a lead, and wondered if the girl's keen eyes would notice that she now had a coven of witches sniffing after her. Sorrel heaved a breath her powerful shoulders lifting. She set down the dagger. At the Omega, we knew our place and what was expected of us. We had a routine. We had purpose. Before that, we hunted the Crochens. Here, here we are no more than weapons waiting to be used. She gestured to the useless blades on the table. Here, your grandmother is not around to influence things, to provide strict rules, to instill fear. She would make that duke's life a living hell. Are you saying that I'm a poor leader, Sorrel? A too quiet question. I'm saying the Thirteen don't know why your grandmother made you kill the Crokin for that cloak. Dangerous. Such dangerous ground. I think you sometimes forget what my grandmother can do. 
Trust me, Manon, we don't, Sorrel said softly as the blacksmith appeared, a set of blades in his powerful arms. And more than any of us, Astrin has never for a second forgotten what your grandmother is capable of. Manon knew she could demand more answers, but she also knew that Sorrel was stone, and stone would not break. So she faced the approaching blacksmith as he laid his other examples on the table, her stomach tight. With hunger, she told herself. With hunger. Chapter 13 Aelin didn't know whether she should be comforted by the fact that despite the changes two years had heaped upon her life, despite the hells she's walked through, the assassin's keep hadn't altered. The hedges flanking the towering wrought iron fence around the property were the exact same height, still trimmed with masterful precision, the curling gravel drive beyond still bore the same grey stones, and the sweeping manor home was still pale and elegant, its polished oak doors gleamed in the mid-morning sunlight. No one on the quiet residential street paused to look at the house that held some of the fiercest assassins in Aurelia. For years now, the assassin's keep had remained anonymous, unremarkable, one of the many palatal homes in wealthy southwestern district of Lifthold, right under the king of Adarlan's nose. The iron gates were open, and the assassins disguised as common watchmen were unfamiliar to her as she strolled down the drive, but they didn't stop her despite the suit and weapons she wore, despite the hood covering her features. Night would have been better for sneaking across the city, another test, to see if she could make it here in daylight without attracting too much attention. Thankfully, most of the city was preoccupied with preparations for the prince's birthday celebrations the next day. Vendors were already out, selling everything from little cakes to flags, bearing the Ardarlinian wyvern to blue ribbons, to match the prince's eyes, of course. It made her stomach turn. Getting here undetected had been a minor test, though, compared to the one looming before her, and the one awaiting tomorrow. Aiden. Every breath she took seemed to echo his name. Aiden. 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 But she shoved away the thought of him, of what might have already been done to him in those dungeons, as she strode up the expansive front steps of the keep. She hadn't been in this house since the night everything had gone to hell. There, to her right, were the stables where she'd knocked Wesley unconscious as he tried to warn her about the trap that had been laid for her. And there, a level up, looking out over the front garden, were the three windows of her old bedroom. They were open, the heavy velvet curtains blowing in the cool spring breeze, as if the room were being aired out for her, unless Arabin had given her quarters to someone else. The carved oak doors swung open as she hit the top step, revealing a butler she'd never seen before, who bowed nonetheless and gestured behind him. Just past the grand marble foyer, the double doors of Arabin's study were wide open. She didn't glance at the threshold as she passed over it, sweeping into the house that had been a haven and a prison and a hellhole. Gods, this house. Beneath the vaulted ceilings and the glass chandeliers of the entry hall, the marble floors were polished so brightly that she could see her own dark reflection as she walked. Not a soul in sight, not even wretched turn. They were either out or under orders to stay away until this meeting was done, as though Arobin didn't want to be overheard. The smell of the keep wrapped around her, tugging at her memory. Fresh-cut flowers and baking bread barely masked the tang of metal or the lightning-crisp feeling of violence throughout. Every step toward that ornate study had her bracing herself. There he was, seated at the massive desk, his auburn hair like molten steel in the sunlight pouring in from the floor-to-ceiling windows flanking one side of the wood-paneled room. She shut out the information she'd learned in Wesley's letter and kept her posture loose, casual. But she couldn't help glancing at the rug before the desk, a movement Arabin either noted or expected. A new rug, he said, looking up from the papers before him. The bloodstains on the other one never came out. Pity, she said, slumping into one of the chairs before his desk, trying not to look at the chair beside hers, where Sam had usually sat. The other rug was prettier. Until her blood had soaked it when Arabin had beaten her for ruining his slave trade agreement, making Sam watch the entire time. And when she was unconscious, he'd beaten Sam into oblivion, too. She wondered which of the scars on Arabin's knuckles were from those beatings. She heard the butler approach, but didn't deign to look at him as Arabin said, We're not to be disturbed. The butler murmured his understanding, and the study doors clicked shut. Aelin slung a leg over the arm of her chair. To what do I owe this summoning? Arabin rose, a fluid movement limbed with restrained power, and came around the desk to lean on its edge. I merely wanted to see how you were doing the day before your grand event. His silver eyes flickered. I wanted to wish you luck. And to see if I was going to betray you? Why would I ever think that? 
I don't think you want to get into a conversation about trust right now. Certainly not. Not when you need all your focus for tomorrow. So many little things that could go wrong, especially if you're caught. She felt the dagger of the implied threat slide between her ribs. You know I don't break easily under torture. Arabin crossed his arms over his broad chest. Of course not. I expect nothing less from my protege than to shield me if the king catches you. So that explained the summons. I never asked, Arabin went on. Will you be doing this as Selena? As good a time as any to cast a bored glance around the study, ever the irreverent protege. Nothing on the desk, nothing on the shelves, not even a box that might contain the amulet of Orinth. She allowed herself one sweep before turning indolent eyes on him. I hadn't planned on leaving a calling card. And what explanation will you give your cousin when you are reunited? The same you gave the noble captain? She didn't want to know how he was aware of that disaster. She hadn't told Lysandra. Since Lysandra still had no idea who she was, she'd think about that later. I'll tell Aiden the truth. Well, let's hope that's excuse enough for him. It was a physical effort not to clamp down on her retort. I'm tired and I don't feel like having a verbal sparring match today. Just tell me what you want so I can go soak in my tub. Not a lie. Her muscles ached from tracking Valgfoot soldiers across Rifthold the night before. You know my facilities are at your disposal. Arabin pinned his attention on her right leg, slung over the arm of the chair, as if he'd somehow figured out that it was giving her trouble, as if he knew that the fight at the vaults had somehow aggravated the old wound she'd received during her duel with Kane. My healer could rub down that leg for you. I wouldn't want you to be in pain, or handicapped for tomorrow. Training kept her features bored. You truly do like hearing yourself talk, don't you? A sensual laugh. Fine, no verbal sparring. She waited, still lounging in the chair. Arobin ran an eye down the suit, and when his gaze met hers, there was only a cold, cruel killer staring out at her. I have it on good authority that you've been monitoring patrols of the Kingsguard, but leaving them undisturbed. Have you forgotten our little bargain? She smiled a little. Of course not. Then why is my promised demon not in my dungeon? Because I'm not capturing one until after Aiden is freed. A blink. These things might lead the king right to you, to us. I'm not jeopardizing Aiden's safety to satisfy your morbid curiosity. And who's to say that you won't forget to help me when you're busy playing with your new toy? Arabin pushed off the desk and approached, bending over her chair close enough to share breath. I'm a man of my word, Selena. Again, that name. He took a step back and cocked his head. Though you, on the other hand... I recall you promising to kill Lysander years ago. I was surprised when she returned unharmed. You did your best to ensure that we hated each other. I figured why not go the opposite way for once. Turns out she's not nearly as spoiled and selfish as you made me believe. Ever the petulant protege, ever the smartass. Though if you want me to kill her, I'll gladly turn my attention to that instead of the Valg. A soft laugh. No need. She serves me well enough. Replaceable, though, should you decide you'd like to uphold your promise. Was that a test, then, to see if I follow through on my promises? Beneath her gloves, the mark she'd carved into her palm burned like a brand. It was a present. Stick with jewelry and clothes, she rose and glanced down at her suit, or useful things. His eyes followed hers and lingered. You fill it out better than you did at seventeen. And that was quite enough. She clicked her tongue and turned away, but he gripped her arm, right where those invisible blades would snap out. He knew it, too. A dare. A challenge. You will need to lie low with your cousin once he escapes tomorrow, Arabin said. Should you decide not to fulfill your end of the bargain, you'll find out very quickly, Selena darling, how deadly this city can be for those on the run, even fire-breathing bitch queens. No more declarations of love or offers to walk over coals for me? A sensual laugh. You were always my favorite dance partner. He came close enough to graze his lips against hers if she should sway a fraction of an inch. If you want me to whisper sweet nothings into your ear, Majesty, I'll do just that but you'll still get me what I need. She didn't dare pull back. There was always such a gleaming in his silver eyes, like the cold light before dawn. She'd never been able to look away from it. He angled his head, the sun catching in his auburn hair. What about the prince, though? Which prince, she said carefully. Arabin gave a knowing smile, retreating a few inches. There are three princes, I suppose. Your cousin, and then the two that now share Dorian Helvilliard's body, does the brave captain know that his friend is currently being devoured by one of those demons? Yes. Does he know that you might decide to do the smart thing and put the king's son down before he can become a threat? She held his stare. 
Why don't you tell me? You're the one who's been meeting with him. His answering chuckle sent ice skittering over her bones. So the captain has a hard time sharing with you. He seems to share everything just fine with his former lover, that Felique girl. Did you know that her father makes the best pear tarts in all of the entire capital? He's even supplying some for the prince's birthday. Ironic, isn't it? It was her turn to blink. She'd known Kale had at least one lover other than Lithian, but Nezrin? And how convenient for him not to tell her, especially when he'd thrown whatever nonsense he believed about her and Rowan in her face. Your fairy prince, he'd snapped. She doubted Kaol had done anything with the young woman since he'd left. She doubted Kaol had done anything with the young woman since she'd left for Wendelin, but, but she was feeling exactly what Arabin wanted her to feel. Why don't you stay out of our business, Arabin? Don't you want to know why the captain came to me again last night? Bastards, both of them. She'd warn Kaol not to tangle with Arabin, to reveal that she didn't know or to conceal that vulnerability. Kaol wouldn't jeopardize her safety or her plans for tomorrow, regardless of what information he kept from her. She smirked at Arabin. No, I was the one who sent him here. She sauntered toward the study doors. You must be truly bored if you summon me merely to taunt me. A glimmer of amusement. Good luck tomorrow. All the plans are in place in case you were worried. Of course they are. I'd expect nothing less from you. She flung open one of the doors and waved her hand in a lazy dismissal. See you around, master. Aelin visited at the Royal Bank again on her way home, and when she returned to her apartment, Lysander was waiting, as they'd planned. Even better, Lysander had brought food. Lots of food. Aelin plunked down on the kitchen table where Lysander currently lounged. The courtesan was gazing toward the wide window above the kitchen sink. You do realize you've got a shadow on the roof next door, don't you? He's harmless. And useful. Kaol had men watching the keep, the palace gates, and the apartment, all to monitor Arobin. Aelin cocked her head keen eyes? Your master taught me a few tricks over the years. To protect myself, of course. To protect his investment, was what she didn't need to say. You read the letter, I take it? Every damn word. Indeed, she'd read through Wesley's letter again and again until she'd memorized the dates and names and accounts, until she had seen so much fire that she was glad her magic was currently stifled. It changed little of her plans, but it helped. Now that she knew she wasn't wrong, that the names on her list were her correct, I'm sorry I couldn't keep it, Aelin said. Burning it was the only way to stay safe. Lysander just nodded, picking out a piece of lint on the bodice of her rust-colored gown. The red sleeves were loose and billowing with tight black velvet cuffs and gold buttons that glinted in the morning light as she reached for one of the hothouse grapes Aelin had bought yesterday. An elegant gown, but modest. The Lysander I knew used to wear far less clothing, Aelin said. Lysander's green eyes flickered. The Lysander you knew died a long time ago. So had Selena Sardothian. I asked you to meet me today so we could talk. About Arabin? About you. Elegant eyebrows narrowed. And when do we get to talk about you? Well, what do you want to know? What are you doing in Rifthold, aside from rescuing the general tomorrow? Aelin said, I don't know you well enough to answer that question. Lysander merely cocked her head. Why Aiden? He's more useful to me alive than dead. Not alive. Lysandra tapped a manicured nail on the worn table. After a moment, she said, I used to be so jealous of you. Not only did you have Sam, but also Arabin. I was such a fool, believing that he gave you everything and denied you nothing, hating you because I always knew deep down that I was just a pawn for him to use against you, a way to make you fight for his affection, to keep you on your toes, to hurt you. And I enjoyed it because I thought it was better to be someone's pawn than nothing at all. Her hand shook as she raised it to brush back a strand of her hair. I think I would have continued on that way for my whole life, but then... Then Arabin killed Sam and arranged for your capture and... and summoned me the night you were hauled to Endovier. Afterward, on the carriage ride home, I just cried. I didn't know why. But Wesley was in the carriage with me. That was the night that everything changed between us. Lysandra glanced down at the scars around Aelin's wrists, then at the tattoo marring her own. Aelin said... The other night, you didn't just come to warn me about Arabin. When Lysandra raised her head, her eyes were frozen. No, she said with soft savagery. I came to help you destroy him. You must trust me a great deal to have said that. You wrecked the vaults, Lysandra said. It was for Sam, wasn't it? Because those people, they all worked for Rourke Farron and were there when... She shook her head. It's all for Sam. Whatever you have planned for Arabin. 
Besides, if you betray me, there's little that can hurt me more than what I've already endured. Aelin leaned back in her chair and crossed her legs, trying not to think about the darkness the woman across from her had survived. I went too long without demanding retribution. I have no interest in forgiveness. Lysandra smiled, and there was no joy in it. After he murdered Wesley, I lay awake in his bed and thought about killing him right there. But it didn't seem like enough, and the debt didn't belong to only me. For a moment, Aelin couldn't say anything. Then she shook her head. You honestly mean to imply that you've been waiting for me this whole time? You loved Sam as much as I loved Wesley. Her chest hollowed out, but she nodded. Yes, she'd loved Sam, more than she'd ever loved anyone, even Kaol, and reading in Wesley's letter exactly what Arabin had ordered Rourke Farron to do to Sam had left a raging wound in the core of her. Sam's clothes were still in the two bottom drawers of her dresser, where Arabin had indeed unpacked them. She'd worn one of his shirts to bed these past two nights. Arabin would pay. I'm sorry, Aelin said. For the years I spent being a monster towards you, for whatever part I played in your suffering, I wish I'd been able to see myself better. I wish I'd seen everything better. I'm sorry. Lysandra blinked. We were both young and stupid, and should have seen each other as allies, but there's nothing to prevent us from seeing each other that way now. Lysandra gave her a grin that was more wolfish than refined. If you're in, I'm in. That fast, that easily, the offer of friendship was tossed her way. Rowan might have been her dearest friend, her Karanam, but she missed female companionship deeply, though an old panic rose up at the thought of Nehemia not being there anymore to provide it, and part of her wanted to throw the offer back in Lysandra's face just because she wasn't Nehemia. She forced herself to stare down that fear. Aelin said hoarsely, I'm in. Lysandra heaved a sigh. Oh, thank the gods. Now I can talk to someone about clothes without being asked how so-and-so would approve of it or gobble down a box of chocolates without someone telling me that I'd better watch my figure. Tell me you like chocolates. You do, right? I remember stealing a box from your room once when you were out killing someone. They were delicious. Aelin waved a hand toward the boxes of goodies on the table. You brought chocolate. As far as I'm concerned, you're my new favorite person. Lysandra chuckled, a surprisingly deep, wicked sound, probably a laugh she never let Arabin or her clients hear. Some night soon, I'll sneak back in here and we can eat chocolates until we vomit. We're such refined, genteel ladies. Please, Lysandra said, waving a manicured hand. You and I are nothing but wild beasts wearing human skins. Don't even try to deny it. The courtesan had no idea how close she was to the truth. Aelin wondered how the woman would react to her other form, to the elongated canines. Somehow she doubted Lysandra would call her a monster for it, or for the flames at her command. Lysandra's smile flickered. Everything's set for tomorrow? Is that worry I detect? You're just going to waltz into the palace and think a different hair color will keep you from being noticed? You trust Arabin that much? Do you have a better idea? Lysandra's shug was a definition of nonchalance. I happen to know a thing or two about playing different roles. How to turn eyes away when you don't want to be seen. I do know how to be stealthy, Lysandra. The plan is sound, even if it was Arabin's idea. What if we killed two birds with one stone? She might have dismissed it, might have shot her down, but there was such a wicked feral gleam in the Cordian's eyes. So Aelin rested her forearms on the table. I'm listening. Chapter 14 For every person Kao and the rebels saved, it seemed there were always several more who made it to the butchering block. The sun was setting as he and Nezrin crouched on a rooftop flanking the small square. The only people who bothered to watch were the typical lowlifes, content to breathe in the misery of others. They didn't bother him half as much as the decorations that had been put up in the honor of Dorian's birthday tomorrow. Red and gold streamers and ribbons hung across the square like a net, while baskets of blue and white flowers bordered its outer edges. A charnel house bedecked in late spring cheer. Nezrin's bowstring groaned as she pulled it back farther. Steady, he warned her. She knows what she's doing, Aelin muttered from a few feet away. Kaol cut her a glance. Remind me why you're here. I wanted to help. Or is this an Ar Ar Darlinian only rebellion? Kale stifled his retort and turned his glare onto the square below. Tomorrow, everything he cared about depended on her. Antagonizing her wouldn't be smart, even if it killed him to leave Dorian in her hands. But about tomorrow, he said tightly, not taking his attention off the execution about to unfold. You don't touch Dorian. Me? Never. Aelin purred. It's not a joke. You don't hurt him. Nezrin ignored them and angled her bow to the left. 
I can't get a clear shot at any of them. Three men now stood before the block, a dozen guards around them. The boards of the wooden platform were already deeply stained with red from weeks of use. Gatherers monitored the massive clock above the execution platform, waiting for the iron hand to hit the six o'clock evening marker. They'd even tied gold and crimson ribbons to the clock tower's lower rim. Seven minutes now. Kaol made himself look at Aelin. Do you think you'll be able to save him? Maybe. I'll try. No reaction in her eyes, in her posture. Maybe. Maybe. He said, Does Dorian actually matter, or is he a pawn for Terrison? Don't even start that. For a moment he thought she was done, but then she spat, Killing him, Kaol, would be a mercy. Killing him would be a gift. I can't make the shot, Nezrin said again, a bit more sharply. Touch him, Kaol said, and I'll make sure those bastards down there find Aiden. Nezrin silently turned to them, slackening her bow. It was the only card he had to play, even if it made him a bastard as well. The wrath Kaol found in Aelin's eyes was world-ending. You bring my court into this, Kaol, Aelin said with a lethal softness, and I don't care what you were to me, or what you have done to me. You betray them, you hurt them, and I don't care how long it takes, or how far you go, I'll burn you and your god's damn kingdom to ash. Then you'll learn just how much of a monster I can be. Too far. He'd gone too far. We are not enemies, Nezrin said, and though her face was calm, her eyes darted between them. We have enough shit to worry about tomorrow, and right now. She pointed with her arrow toward the square. Five minutes until six. Do we go down there? Too public, Aelin said. Don't risk exposing yourself. There's another patrol a quarter mile away, headed in this direction. Of course she knew about it. Again, Kaol said. Why are you here? She just snuck up on them with far too much ease. Aelin studied Nezrin a bit too thoughtfully. How good's your accuracy, Felique? I don't miss, Nezrin said. Aelin's teeth gleamed. My kind of woman. She gave Kaol a knowing smile. And he knew. He knew that she was aware of the history between them, and she didn't particularly care. He couldn't tell whether or not it was a relief. I'm debating ordering Arabin's men off the mission tomorrow, Aelin said, those turquoise eyes fixed on Nezrin's face, on her hands, on her bow. I want Felique on wall duty instead. No, Kaol said. Are you her keeper? He didn't deign to respond. Aelin crooned. I thought so. But Nezrin wouldn't be on wall duty, and neither would he. He was too recognizable to risk being close to the palace, and Aelin and her piece-of-shit master had apparently decided that he'd be better off running interference along the border of the slums, making sure the coast was clear. Nezrin has her orders already. In the square, people began swearing at the three men who were watching the clock with pale, gaunt faces. Some of the onlookers even threw bits of spoiled food at them. Maybe the city did deserve Aelin Galathinius's flames. Maybe Kaol deserved to burn, too. He turned back to the woman. Shit, Aelin swore, and he looked behind him in time to see the guards shove the first victim, a sobbing, middle-aged man, toward the block, using the pommels of their swords to knock his knees out from under him. They weren't waiting until six. Another prisoner, also middle-aged, began shaking, and a dark stain spread across the front of his pants. Gods. Kaol's muscles were locked, and even Nezrin couldn't draw her bow fast enough as the axe rose. A thud silenced the city square. People applauded. Applauded. The sound covered the second thud of the man's head falling and rolling away. Then Kaol was in another room, in the castle that had once been his home, listening to the thud of flesh and bone on marble, red mist coat in the air, Dorian screaming, Oathbreaker, liar, traitor. Kaol was all of those things now, but not to Dorian, never to his true king. Take out the clock tower in the garden, he said, the words barely audible. He felt Aelin turn toward him, and magic will be free. It was a spell, three towers, all built of wordstone. Take one out, and magic is free. She glanced northward without so much as a blink of surprise, as though she could see all the way to the glass castle. Thank you, she murmured. That was it. It's for Dorian's sake. Perhaps cruel, perhaps selfish, but true. The king is expecting you tomorrow, he went on. What if he stops caring about the public knowing and unleashes his magic on you? You know what happened with Dorian. She scanned the roof tiles as if reading her mental map of the celebration, the map he'd given her. Then she swore. He could lay traps for me, and Aiden. With the word marks, he could write out spells on the floor, or in the doors, keyed to me or Aiden, and we would be helpless, the exact same way I trapped that thing in the library. Shit, she breathed. Shit! Gripping her slackened bow, Nezrin said, Brulo told us the king has his best men escorting Aiden from the dungeons to the hall, perhaps spelling those areas too, if he spells them. 
If is too big a gamble to make, and it's too late to change your plans, Aelin said. If I had those gods damned booked, I could maybe have find some sort of protection for me and Aiden, some spell, but I won't have enough time tomorrow to grab them from my old rooms. The gods know if they're still even there. They're not, Kaol said. Aelin's brows flicked up. Because I have them. I grabbed them when I left the castle. Aelin pursed her lips, and what he could have sworn was reluctant appreciation. We don't have much time. She began climbing over the roof and out of sight. There are two prisoners left, she clarified, and I think those streamers would look better with some Val Gwen on them anyway. Nezrin remained on the rooftop while Aelin went to another across the square, faster than Kaol had thought possible. That left him on street level. He hurried as swiftly as he could through the crowd, spotting his three men gathered near the edge of the platform, ready. The clock struck six just as Kaol positioned himself, after making sure two more of his men were waiting down a narrow alley. Just as the guards finally cleared away the body of the first prisoner and dragged forward the second, the man was sobbing, begging them as he was forced to kneel in the puddle of his friend's blood. The executioner lifted his axe, and a dagger, courtesy of Aelin Galathinius, went clean through the executioner's throat. Black blood sprayed, some onto the streamers as Aelin had promised. Before the guards could shout, Nezrin opened fire from the other direction. That was all the distraction Kaol needed as he and his men surged forward toward the platform amid the panicking, fleeing crowd. Nezrin and Aelin had both fired again by the time he had hit the stage, the wood treacherously slick with blood. He grabbed the two prisoners and roared at them to run, run, run. His men were blade to blade with the guards as he rushed, the stumbling prisoners down the step and into the safety of the alley, and the rebels waiting beyond. Block after block they fled, leaving the chaos of the square behind until they hit the Avery and Kael set about attaining them a boat. Nezrin found him leaving the docks an hour later, unharmed but splattered with blood. What happened? Pandemonium, Nezrin said, scanning the river under the settling sun. Everything fine? He nodded. And you? Both of us are fine. A kindness, he thought with a flicker of shame, that she knew he couldn't bring himself to ask about Aelin. Nezrin turned away, heading back the direction she came. Where are you going? he asked. To wash and change, and then go tell the family of the man who died. It was protocol, even if it was horrible. Better to have the families genuinely mourn than risk being looked on any longer as a rebel sympathizers. You don't have to do that, he said. I'll send one of the men. I'm a city guard, she said plainly. My presence won't be unexpected. And besides, she said, her eyes glinting with her usual faint amusement. You yourself said I don't exactly have a line of suitors waiting outside my father's house, so what else do I have to do with myself tonight? Tomorrow's an important day, he said, even as he cursed himself for the words he'd spat out the other night. An ass, that's what he'd been, even if she'd never let on that it bothered her. I was just fine before you came along, Kaol, she said, tired, possibly bored. I know my limits. I'll see you tomorrow. But he said, why go to the families yourself? Nezrin's dark eyes shifted toward the river, because it reminds me what I have to lose if I'm caught, or if we fail. Night fell, and Aelin knew she was being followed as she stalked from rooftop to rooftop. Right now, even hours later, hitting the street was the most dangerous thing she could possibly do, given how pissed off the guards were after she and the rebels had stolen their prisoners right out from under them. And she knew that because she had been listening to them curse and hiss for the past hour as she trailed a patrol of black uniformed guards on the route she'd noted the night before, along the docks, then keeping to the shadows off the main drags and taverns and brothels in the slums, and then near, but keeping a healthy distance from, the Riverside Shadow Market. Interesting to learn how their route did or didn't change when chaos erupted, what hidey holes they rushed to, what sort of formations they used, what streets were left unmonitored when all hell broke loose, as it would tomorrow, with Aiden. But Arabin's claims had been right, matching the maps Kaol and Nesbrin had made too. She'd known that if she told Kaol why she'd shown up at the execution, he would get in the way somehow, send Nesrin to follow her perhaps. She'd needed to know how skilled they were, all the parties that would be so crucial in tomorrow's events, and then see this. Just as Arabin had told her, each guard wore a thick black ring, and they moved with jerks and twitches that made her wonder how well the demons squatting inside their bodies were adjusting. Their leader, a pale man with night-dark hair, moved the most fluidly, like ink and water, she thought. She had left them to stalk toward another part of the city while she continued on toward where the craftsman district jutted out into the curve of the Avery, until all was silent around her and the scent of those rotting corpses faded away. 
Atop the roof of a glass-blowing warehouse, the tile still warm from the heat of the day or the massive furnaces inside, Aelin surveyed the empty alley below. The infernal spring rain began again, tinkling on the sloped roof, the many chimneys. Magic, Cahill had told her how to free it, so easy and yet a monumental task, in need of careful planning. After tomorrow, though, if she survived, she set about doing it. She shimmied down a drain pipe on the side of a crumbling brick building, splashing down a bit too loudly in a puddle of what she hoped was rain. She whistled as she strolled down the empty alley, a jaunty little tune she'd overheard at one of the slums' many tavern. Still, she was honestly a little surprised that she got nearly halfway down the alley before a patrol of the King's Guards stepped into her path, their swords like quicksilver in the dark. The commander of the patrol, the demon inside him, looked at her and smiled as though it already knew what her blood tasted like. Aelin grinned right back at him, flicking her wrists and sending the blade shooting out of her suit. Hello, gorgeous. Then she was upon them, slicing and twirling and ducking. Five guards were dead before the others could even move. The blood they leaked wasn't red, though. It was black, and slid down the sides of her blades, dense and shining as oil. The stench like curdled milk and vinegar hit her as hard as the clashing of their swords. The reek grew, overpowering the lingering smoke from the glass factories around them, worsening as Aelin dodged the demon's blow and swiped low. The man's stomach opened up like a festering wound, and black blood and the gods knew what else sloshed onto the street. Disgusting. Almost as bad as what wafted from the sewer grate at the other end of the alley, already open, already oozing that too familiar darkness. The rest of the patrol closed in. Her wrath became a song in her blood as she ended them. When blood and rain lay in puddles on the broken cobblestones, when Aelin stood in a field of fallen men, she began slicing. Head after head tumbled away. Then she leaned against the wall, waiting, counting. They did not rise. Aelin stalked from the alley, kicking shut the sewer grate, and vanished into the rainy night. Dawn broke, the day clear and warm. Aelin had been up half the night scouring the books Kael had saved, including her old friend, The Walking Dead. Reciting what she'd learned in the quiet of her apartment, Aelin donned the clothes Arabin had sent over, checking and rechecking that there were no surprises and everything was where she needed it to be. She let each step, each reminder of her plan anchor her, keep her from dwelling too long on what would come when the festivities began, and then she went to save her cousin. Chapter 15 Aiden Ashriver was ready to die. Against his will, he'd recovered over the past two days, the fever breaking after sunset last night. He was strong enough to walk, albeit slowly, as they escorted him to the dungeon's washroom where they chained him down to wash and scrub him, and even risked shaving him despite his best efforts to slit his own throat on the razor. It appeared that they wanted him presentable for the court when they cut off his head with his own blade, the Sword of Orinth. After cleaning his wounds, they shoved him into pants and a loose white shirt, yanked back his hair, and dragged him up the stairs. Guards with dark uniforms flanked him three deep on both sides, four in front and behind, and every door and exit had one of the bastards posted by it. He was too drained from dressing to provoke them to putting a sword through him, so he let them lead him through the towering doors to into the ballroom. Red and gold banners hung from the rafters, springtime blossoms covered every table, and an archway of hothouse roses had been crafted over the dais from which the royal family would watch the festivities before his execution. The windows and doors beyond the platform were where he would be killed. Opened onto one of the gardens, a guard stationed on every other foot, others positioned in the garden itself. If the king wanted to set a trap for Aelin, he certainly hadn't been bothered to be very subtle about it. It was civilized of them, Aiden realized, as he was shoved up the wooden steps onto the platform to give him a stool to sit on. At least he wouldn't have to lounge on the floor like a dog while he watched them all to pretend that they weren't just here to see his head roll. And a stool, he realized with grim satisfaction, would make a good enough weapon when the time came. So Aiden let them chain him in the shackles anchored to the floor of the platform. Let them put the Sword of Orinth on display a few feet behind him, its scarred bone pommel glinting in the morning light. It was just a matter of finding the right moment to meet the end of his own choosing. Chapter 16 The demon made him sit on a dais, on a throne beside a crowned woman who had not noticed that the thing using his mouth wasn't the person who had been born of her flesh. To his other side lounged the man who controlled the demon inside of him, and in front of him, 
The ballroom was full of tittering nobility who could not see that he was still in here, still screaming. The demon had broken a little farther through the barrier today, and now it looked through his eyes with an ancient glittering malice. It was starved for this world. Perhaps the world deserved to be devoured by the thing. Maybe it was that traitorous thought alone that had caused such a hole to rip in the barrier between them. Maybe it was winning. Maybe it already won. So he was forced to sit on that throne and speak with words that were not his own and share his eyes with something from another realm who gazed at this sunny world with ravenous, eternal hunger. The costume itched like hell. The paint all over her didn't help. Most of the important guests had arrived in the days preceding the party, but those who dwelled inside the city or in the outlying foothills now formed a glittering line stretching through the massive front doors. Guards were posted there, checking invitations, asking questions, peering into faces none too keen to be interrogated. The entertainers, vendors, and help, however, were ordered to use one of the side entrances. That was where Aelin had found Madame Florine and her troop of dancers, clad in costumes of black tulle and silk and lace like liquid night in the mid-morning sun. Shoulders back, core tight, arms loose at her sides, Aelin eased into the middle of the flock. With her hair dyed a ruddy shade of brown, and her face coated in the heavy cosmetics the dancers all wore, she blended in well enough that none of the others looked her way. She focused entirely on her role of trembling novice, and looking more interested in how the other dancers perceived her than in the six guards stationed at the small wooden door and the side of the stone wall. The castle hallway beyond was narrow, good for daggers, bad for swords, and deadly for these dancers if she got into trouble. If Arabin had indeed betrayed her. Head down, Aelin subtly monitored the first test of trust. The chestnut-haired Florine walked along her line of dancers like an admiral aboard a ship. Aging but beautiful, Florine's every movement was layered with a grace that Aelin herself had never been able to replicate, no matter how many lessons she'd had with her growing up. The woman had been the most celebrated dancer in the Empire, and since her retirement, she remained its most valued teacher. Instructor Overlord, Aelin had called her in the years that she trained under the woman, learning the most fashionable dances and ways to move and hone her body. Florine's hazel eyes were on the guards ahead as she paused beside Aelin, with a frown on her lips. "'You still need to work on your posture,' the woman said. Aelin met Florine's sidelong gaze. It's an honor to be an understudy for you, madam. I do hope Gillian soon recovers from her illness. The guards waved through what looked to be a troop of jugglers, and they inched forward. You look in good enough spirits, Florine murmured. Aelin made a show of ducking her head, curling her shoulders, and willing a blush to rise to her cheeks. The new understudy bashful at the compliments of her mistress. Considering where I was ten months ago? Florine sniffed, and her gaze lingered on the thin bands of scars across Aelin's wrist, that even the painted worlds couldn't conceal. They'd raised the top of the dancer's open-backed costumes, but even so, and even with the body paint, the upper ends of her tattoo-covered scars peeked through. If you think I had anything to do with the events that led to that, Aelin's words were barely louder than a crunch of silk shoes on gravel, as she said. You'd already be dead if you had had. It wasn't a bluff. When she'd written her plans on that ship, Florine's name had been one that she'd written down and then crossed out after careful consideration. Aelin continued, I trust you made the proper adjustments. Not just the slight change in the costumes to accommodate the weapons and supplies Aelin would need to smuggle in, all paid for by Arabin, of course. No, the big surprises would come later. A bit late to be asking that, isn't it? Madame Florine purred, the dark jewels at her neck and ears glimmering. You must trust me a great deal to have even appeared. I trust that you like getting paid more than you like the king. Arabin had given a massive sum to pay off Florine. She kept an eye on the guards, as she said, and since the royal theatre was shut down by his imperial majesty, I trust we both agree that what was done to those magicians was a crime as unforgivable as the massacres of the slaves of Indovier and Calcoa. She knew she'd gamble correctly when she saw agony flicker in Florine's eyes. Peter was my friend, Florine whispered, the colour leaching from her tan cheeks. There was no finer conductor, no greater ear. He made my career. He helped me establish all this. She waved a hand to encompass the dancers, the castle, the prestige she'd acquired. I miss him. There was nothing calculated, nothing cold, when Aelin put a hand over her own heart. I will miss going to hear him conduct the Stygian suite every autumn. I will spend the rest of my life knowing that I may never again hear finer music, never again experience a shred of what I felt sitting in that theater while he conducted. 
Madame Florine wrapped her arms around herself. Despite the guards ahead, despite the task that neared with every tick of the clock, it took Aelin a moment to be able to speak again. But that hadn't been what made Aelin agree to Arabin's plan, to trust Florine. Two years ago, finally free of Arabin's leash but nearly beggared thanks to paying her debts, Aelin had continued to take lessons with Florine, not only to keep current with the popular dances for her work, but also to keep flexible and fit. Florine had refused to take her money. Moreover, after each lesson, Florine had allowed Aelin to sit at the pianoforte by the window and play until her fingers were sore, since she had been forced to leave her beloved instrument at the assassin's keep. Florine had never mentioned it, never made her feel like it was charity, but it had been a kindness when Aelin had desperately needed one. Aelin said under her breath, "'You've memorized the preparations for you and your girls? "'Those who wish to flee may come on the ship Arabin hired. "'I have made space for all, just in case. "'If they're stupid enough to stay in Riffold, then they deserve their fate.'" Aelin hadn't risked being seen meeting with Florine until now, and Florine hadn't even dared to pack her belongings for fear of being discovered. She would only take what she could carry with her to the performance, money, jewels, and flee to the docks the moments the chaos erupted. There was a good chance she wouldn't make it out of the palace, and neither would her girls, despite the escape plans provided by Kaol and Brulo and the cooperation of the kinder guards. Aelin found herself saying, Thank you. Florine's mouth quirked to the side. Now there's something you never learned from your master. The dancers at the front of the line reached the guards, and Florine sighed loudly and strutted toward them, bracing her hands on her narrow hips, power and grace lining every step closer to the black uniform guard studying along with. One by one, he looked over the dancers, comparing them with the list he bore, checking rosters, detailed ones. But thanks to Ress having broken into the barracks last night and adding a fake name along with her description, Aelin would be on the list. They inched closer, Aelin keeping toward the back of the group to buy time to note details. Gods, this castle, the same in every possible way, but different. Or maybe it was she who was different. One by one, the dancers were allowed between the blank-faced guards and hurried down the narrow castle hallway, giggling and whispering to one another. Aelin rose up onto her toes to study the guards at the doors, no more than the novice scrunching her face in impatient curiosity. Then she saw them. Written across the threshold stones in dark paint were word marks. They'd been beautifully rendered, as though merely decorative, but they must be at every door, every entrance. Sure enough, even the windows a level up had small dark symbols on them, no doubt keyed to Aelin Galathinius, to alert the king to her presence or to trap her in a place long enough to be captured. A dancer elbowed Aelin in the stomach to get her to stop leaning over her shoulder to peer over their heads. Aelin gaped at the girl and then let out a oomph of pain. The dancer glared over her shoulder, mouthing to shut up. Aelin burst into tears, loud, blubbering, <laughs> tears. The dancers froze, the one ahead of her stepping back, glancing to either side. Th that hurt, Aelin said, clutching her stomach. I didn't do anything, the woman hissed. Aelin kept crying. Ahead, Florine ordered her dancers to step aside, and then her face was in Aelin's. What in the name of every god in the realm is this nonsense about? Aelin pointed a shaking finger at the dancer. She hit me. Florine whirled on the wide-eyed dancer who was already proclaiming her innocence, then followed a series of accusations, insults, and more tears, now from the dancer, weeping over her surely ruined career. W water Aelin blubbered to Florine. I, I need a glass of water. The guards had begun pushing toward them. Aelin squeezed Florine's arm hard. N now Florine's eyes sparked, and she faced the guards who approached, barking her demands. Aelin held her breath, waiting for the strike, the slap. But there was one of Ress's friends, one of Kaol's friends, wearing a red flower pinned to his breast, as she'd asked, running off to get water, exactly where Kaol had said he'd be, just in case something went wrong. Aelin clung to Florine until the water appeared, a bucket and ladle, the best the man could come up with. He wisely didn't meet her gaze. With a little sob of thanks, Aelin grabbed both from his hands. They were shaking slightly. He gave Florine a subtle nudge with her foot, urging her forward. Come with me, seethed Florine, dragging her to the front of the line. I've had enough of this idiocy, and you've nearly wrecked your makeup. Careful not to spill the water, Aelin allowed Florine to pull her to the stone-faced guard at the doors. My foolish, useless understudy, Diana, she said to the guard, with flawless steel in her voice, unfazed by the black-eyed demon looking out at her. 
The man studied the list in his hands, scanning, scanning, and crossed off a name. Aelin took a shivering sip of water from the ladle and then dunked it back into the bucket. The guard looked once more at Aelin, and she willed her lower lip to wobble, to the tears to well again as the demon inside devoured her with his eyes, as if all these lovely dancers were dessert. Get in, the man grunted, jerking his chin to the wall behind him. With a silent prayer, Aelin stepped toward the word marks written over the threshold stones, and tripped, sending the bucket of water spraying over the marks. She wailed as she hit the ground, knees barking in genuine pain, and Florian was instantly upon her, demanding she stop being so clumsy and such a crybaby, and then shoving her in, shoving her over the ruined marks, and into the glass castle. Chapter 17 Once Florine and the rest of the dancers were allowed in, they were all stuffed down a narrow servant's hallway. In a matter of moments, the door at the far end would open into the side of the ballroom, and they would flutter out like butterflies. Black, glittering butterflies— here to perform the handmaidens of death dance from one of the more popular symphonies. They weren't stopped or questioned by anyone else, though the guards in every hall watched them like hawks, and not the shape-shifting fey prince kind. So few of Kael's men were present, no sign of Ress or Brulo, but everyone was where Kael had promised they would be, based on Ress and Brulo's information. A platter of honey-roasted ham with crackling sage was carried past on a servant's shoulder, and Aelin tried not to appreciate it, to savor the sense of the food of her enemy even if it was damn fine food. Platter after platter went by, hauled by red-faced servants, no doubt winded from the trek up the kitchens. Trout with hazelnuts, crisp asparagus, tubs of freshly whipped cream, pear tarts, meat pies. Aelin cocked her head, watching the line of servants. A half-smile grew on her face. She waited for the servants to return with empty hands, on their return journey to the kitchens. Finally, the door opened again, and a slim servant in a crisp white apron filed into the dim hall, the loose strands of her inky hair falling out of her braid as she hurried to retrieve the next tray of pear tarts from the kitchen. Aelin kept her face blank, disinterested, as Nezrin Felique glanced her way. Those dark, upturned eyes narrowed slightly. Surprise or nerves, Aelin couldn't tell. But before she could decide how to deal with it, one of the guards signaled to Florine that it was time. Aelin kept her head down even as she felt the demon within the man rake its attention over her and the others. Nezrin was gone, vanished down the stairs, when Aelin turned back. Florine strode down the line of dancers waiting by the door, her hands clasped behind her. Back straight, shoulders back, necks uplifted. You are light, you are air, you are grace. Do not disappoint me. Florine took up the basket of black glass flowers she had her steadiest dancer carry in, each exquisite bloom flickering like an ebony diamond in the dim hall light. If you break these before it is time to throw them down, you are finished. They cost me more than you're worth, and there are no extras. One by one, she handed the flowers down the line, each of them sturdy enough not to snap in the next few minutes. Florine reached Aelin, the basket empty. Watch them and learn, she said loud enough for the demon guard to hear, and put a hand on Aelin's shoulder, ever the consoling teacher. The other dancers, now shifting on their feet, rolling their heads and shoulders, didn't look in her direction. Aelin nodded demurely, as if trying to hide the bitter tears of disappointment, and ducked out of line to stand at Florine's side. Trumpets blasted in through the cracks around the door, and the crowd cheered loud enough to make the floor rumble. I peeked into the great hall, Florine said so quietly Aelin could barely hear her, to see how the general is faring. He is gaunt and pale, but alert, ready, for you. Aelin went still. I always wondered where Arabin found you. Florine murmured, staring at the door as if she could see through it why he took such pains to break you to his will, more so than the others. The woman closed her eyes for a moment, and when she opened them, steel gleamed there. When you shatter the chains of this world and forge the next, remember that art is as vital as food to a kingdom. Without it, a kingdom is nothing, and will be forgotten by time. I have amassed enough money in my miserable life to not need any more, so you will understand me clearly when I say that wherever you set your throne, no matter how long it takes, I will come to you, and I will bring music and dancing. Aelin swallowed hard. Before she could say anything, Florine left her standing at the back of the line and strolled to the door. She paused before it, looking down the line at each dancer. She spoke only when her eyes met Aelin's. Give our king the performance he deserves. Florine opened the door, flooding the hallway with light and music and the scent of roasted meats. The other dancers sucked in a collective breath and sprang forward, one by one, waving those dark glass flowers overhead. As she watched them go, Aelin willed the blood in her veins into black fire. Aiden. Her focus was on Aiden, not the tyrant seated at the front of the room, the man who had murdered her family, murdered Marion, murdered her people. 
If these were her last moments, then at least she would go down fighting, to the sound of exquisite music. It was time. One breath. Another. She was the heir of fire. She was fire, and light, and ash, and embers. She was Aelin Fireheart, and she bowed for no one and nothing, save the crown that was hers by blood and survival and triumph. Aelin squared her shoulders and slipped into the bejeweled crowd. Aiden had been watching the guards in the hours he'd been chained to the stool, and had figured out who best to attack first, who favored a certain side or leg, who might hesitate when faced with the Wolf of the North, and most importantly, who was impulsive and stupid enough to finally run him through despite the king's command. The performances had begun, drawing the attention of the crowd that had been shamelessly gawking at him, and as the two dozen women floated and leaped and twirled into the wide space between the dais and the execution platform, for a moment Aiden felt bad for interrupting. These women had no cause to be caught up in the bloodshed he was about to unleash. It did seem fitting, though, that their sparkling costumes were of darkest black, accented with silver, death's handmaidens, he realized. That was who they portrayed. It was as much as a sign as anything. Perhaps a dark-eyed Silba would offer him a kind death instead of a cruel one at the blood-drenched hand of, of Hellas. Either way, he found himself smiling. Death was death. The dancers were tossing fistfuls of black powder, coating the floor with it, representing ashes of the fallen, probably. One by one, they made pretty little spins and bowed before the king and his son. Time to move. The king was distracted by a uniformed guard whispering in his ear. The prince was watching the dancers with their bored disinterest, and the queen was chatting with whichever courtier she favored that day. The crowd clapped and cooed over the unfolding performance. They'd all come in their finery, such careless wealth. The blood of an empire had paid for those jewels and silks, the blood of his people. An extra dancer was moving through the crowd, some understudy, no doubt trying to get a better view of the performance, and he might not have thought twice about it had she not been taller than the others, bigger, curvier, her shoals broader. She moved more heavily, as if somehow rooted innately to the earth. The light hit her, shining through the lace of the costume sleeves to reveal swirls and whirls of markings on her skin identical to the paint on the dancer's arms and chest, save for her back, where the paint was a little darker, a little different. Dancers like that didn't have tattoos. Before he could see more, between one breath and the next, as a cluster of ladies in massive ball gowns blocked her from sight, she vanished behind a curtained-off doorway, walking right past the guards with a sheepish smile, as if she were lost. When she emerged again, not a minute later, he only knew it was her from the build, the height, the makeup was gone, and her flowing tulle skirt had disappeared. No, not disappeared, he realized, as she slipped back through the doorway without the guards so much as looking at her. The skirt had been reversed into a silken cape, its hood covering her ruddy brown hair as she moved. Moved like a swaggering man, parading for the ladies around him. Moved closer to him, to the stage. The dancers were still tossing their black powder everywhere, circling around and around, flitting their way across the marble floor. None of the guards noticed the dancer turned noble, prowling toward him. One of the courtiers did, but not to cry in alarm. Instead, he shouted a name, a man's name, and the dancer in disguise turned, lifting a hand in greeting toward the man who called and gave a cocky grin. She wasn't just in disguise. She'd become someone else completely. Closer and closer, she strutted, the music from the gallery orchestra rising into a clashing, vibrant finale, each note higher than the last as the dancers raised their glass roses above their heads, a tribute to the king, to death. The disguised dancer stopped outside the ring of guards, flanking Aiden's stage, patting herself down as if checking for a handkerchief that had gone missing, muttering a string of curses. An ordinary, believable pause, no cause for alarm. The guards went back to watching the dancers. But the dancer looked up at Aiden beneath lowered brows. Even disguised as an aristo man, there was wicked, vicious triumph in her turquoise and gold eyes. Behind them, across the hall, the dancers shattered their roses on the floor, and Aiden grinned at his queen as the entire world went to hell. Chapter 18 It wasn't just the glass flowers that had been rigged with a reactive powder quietly purchased by Aelin at the Shadow Market. Every bit of sparkling dust the dancers had tossed about had been full of it, and it was worth every damned silver she'd spent as smoke erupted through the room, igniting the powder they'd been scattering everywhere. The smoke was so thick she could barely see more than a foot ahead, and blended perfectly with the grey cloak that had doubled as the skirt of her costume, just as Arabin had suggested. Screaming halted the music. Aelin was already moving through the nearby stage as the clock tower, the clock tower that would save or damn them all, 
struck noon. There was no black collar around Aiden's neck, and that was all she needed to see, even as relief threatened to wobble her knees. Before the clock tower's first strike finished, she had drawn the daggers built into the bodice of her costume, all the silver thread and beading masked the steel on her, and slashed one across the throat of the nearest guard. Aelin spun and shoved him into the man closest to him as she plunged her other blade deep into the gut of the third. Florine's voice rose above the crowd, ushering her dancers, Out! 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 The second strike of the clock tower sounded, and Aelin yanked her dagger from the belly of the groaning guard, another surging at her from the smoke. The rest would go to Aiden on instinct, but they'd be slowed by the crowds, and she was already close enough. The guard, one of those black uniform nightmares, stabbed with his sword a direct attack to her chest. Aelin parried the thrust aside with one dagger, spinning into his exposed torso. Hot, reeking blood shot onto her hand as she shoved the other blade into his eye. He was still falling as she ran the last few feet to the wooden platform and hurled herself onto it, rolling, keeping low until she was right up under the two guards who were still trying to wave away the veils of smoke. They screamed as she disemboweled them both in two swipes. The fourth strike of the clock sounded, and there was Aiden, the three guards around him impaled by shards of his stool. He was huge, even bigger up close. A guard charged for them out of the smoke, and Aelin shouted, Duck! before throwing her dagger at the man's approaching face. Aiden barely moved fast enough to avoid the blow, and the guard's blood splattered on the shoulder of her cousin's tunic. She lunged for the chains around Aiden's ankles, sheathing her remaining blade at her side. A jolt shocked through her, and the blue light seared her vision as the eye flared. She didn't dare pause, not even for a heartbeat. Whatever spell the king had put on Aiden's chains burned like blue fire as she sliced open her forearm with her dagger and used her blood to draw the symbol she'd memorized on the chains. Unlock. The chains thudded to the ground. Seventh strike of the clock. The screaming shifted into something louder, wilder, and the king's voice boomed over the panicking crowd. A guard rushed at them, his sword out. Another benefit of the smoke. Too risky to start firing arrows. But she'd only give Arabin credit if she got out of this alive. She unsheathed another blade, hidden in the lining of her grey cloak. The guard went down clutching his throat, now split ear to ear. Then she whirled to Aiden, pulling the long chain of the eye from around her neck and threw it over his head. She opened her mouth, but he gasped out, The sword. And that's when she noticed the blade displayed behind his stool. The sword of Orinth, her father's blade. She'd been too focused on Aiden, on the guards and the dancers, to realize what blade it was. Stay close, was all she said as she grabbed the sword from the stand and shoved it into his hands. She didn't let herself think too much about the weight of that blade, or about how it had even gotten there. She just grasped Aiden by the wrist and raced across the platform toward the patio windows, where the crowd was shrieking and guards were trying to establish a line. The clock issued its ninth strike. She'd unlock Aiden's hands as soon as they got to the garden. They didn't have another second to spend in the suffocating smoke. Aiden staggered but kept upright, Close behind as she leaped off the platform into the smoke right where Brulo claimed two guards would hold their position. One died with a dagger to the spine, the other a blow to the side of the neck. She squeezed the hilts of her daggers against the slippery blood now coating them, and every inch of her. His sword gripped in both hands, Aiden jumped down beside her, and his knees buckled. He was injured, but not from any wound she could see. She discerned as much in the moment she'd weaved through the crowd, altering her demeanor as Lysandra had instructed. The paleness of Aiden's face had nothing to do with fear, nor did his shallow breaths. They'd hurt him. It made killing these men very, very easy. The crowd was bottlenecking by the patio doors, just as she had calculated. All it took was her shouting, Fire! Fire! And the screaming turned frantic. The crowd began shattering the windows and the glass doors, trampling one another and the guards. People grabbed buckets to douse the flames, water spraying everywhere and splashing away the word marks on the thresholds. The smoke billowed out ahead, leading the weight into the garden. Aelin pushed Aiden's head down as she shoved him into the mass of fleeing courtiers and servants, thrashing, squeezing, shouting, ripping at her clothes until, until the noontime sun blinded her. Aiden hissed. Weeks in the dungeons had probably wrecked his eyes. Just hold on to me, she said, putting his massive hand on her shoulder. He gripped her hard, his chains knocking against her as she waded through the crowd and into the open, clear air beyond. The clock tower bellowed its twelfth and final strike as Aelin and Aiden skidded to a halt before a line of six guards blocking the entrance to the garden hedges. Aelin stepped out of Aiden's grip, and her cousin swore as his eyes adjusted enough to see what now lay between them and the escape. Don't get in my way, she said to him, then launched herself at the guards. Rowan had taught her a few new tricks. 
She was a whirling cloud of death, a queen of shadows, and these men were already carry-on. Slashing and ducking and whirling, Aelin gave herself completely to that killing calm, until the blood was a mist around her and the gravel was slick with it. Four of Kael's men came racing up, and then ran the other way. Allies or just smart, she didn't care. And when the last of those black uniformed guards had slumped to the bloody ground, she'd searched for Aiden. He'd been gaping, but he let out a low, dark laugh as he stumbled into a sprint beside her, into the hedges. Archers. They had to clear the archers who were sure to begin firing as soon as the smoke vanished. They dashed around in between the hedges she traversed dozens of times during her stay here, when she'd run every morning with Kale. Faster, Aiden, she breathed, but he was already lagging. She paused and sliced into her blood-soaked wrist with a dagger before sketching the unlocking word marks on each of his manacles. Again, light flared and burned, but then the cuffs sprang open silently. Nice trick, he panted, and she yanked the chains off him. She was about to chuck the metal aside when the gravel crunched behind them. Not the guards, and not the king. It was with no small amount of horror that she found Dorian strolling toward them. Chapter 19 Going somewhere? Dorian said, his hands in the pockets of his black pants. The man who spoke those words was not her friend. She knew that before he'd even opened his mouth. The collar of his ebony tunic was unbuttoned, revealing the glimmering wordstone torque at the base of his throat. Unfortunately, your highness, we have another party to get to. She marked the slender red maple to her right. The hedges, the glass palace towering beyond them. They were too deep in the garden to be shot at, but every wasted second was as good as signing her death sentence, and Aiden's. Pity, said the Valg prince inside Dorian. It was just getting exciting. He struck. A wave of black lashed for her, and Aiden shouted in warning. Blue flared before her, deflecting the assault from Aiden, but she was shoved back a step, as if by a hard, dark wind. When the black cleared, the prince stared. Then he gave a lazy, cruel smile. You warded yourself. Clever, lovely human thing. She'd spent all morning painting every inch of her body with word marks in her own blood, mixed with the ink to hide the color. Aiden, run for the wall, she breathed, not daring to take her eyes off the prince. Aiden did no such thing. He's not the prince. Not anymore. I know, which is why you need to... Such heroics, said the thing squatting in her friend. Such foolish hope to think you can get away. Like an asp, he struck again with the wall of black-tainted power. It knocked her clean into Aiden, who grunted in pain but set her upright. Her skin began tickling beneath her costume, as if the blood wards were flaking off with each assault. Useful, but short-lived, precisely why she hadn't wasted them on getting into the castle. But they had to get out of here. Now. She shoved the chains into Aiden's hands, took the Sword of Orinth from him, and stepped toward the prince. Slowly, she unsheathed the blade. Its weight was flawless, and the steel shone as brightly as it had the last time she'd seen it, in her father's hands. The Valg prince snapped another whip of power at her, and she stumbled but kept walking, even as the blood warts beneath her costume crumbled away. One sign, Dorian, she said. Just give me one sign that you're in there. The Valg prince laughed low and harsh, that beautiful face twisted with ancient brutality. His sapphire eyes were empty as he said, I am going to destroy everything you love. She raised her father's sword in both hands, advancing still. You'd never do it, the thing said. Dorian, she repeated, her voice breaking. You are Dorian. Seconds. She had seconds left to give him. Her blood dripped onto the gravel, and she let it pool there, her eyes fixed on the prince as she began tracing a symbol with her foot. The demon chuckled again. Not anymore. She gazed into those eyes. At the mouth she'd once kissed, at the friend she'd once cared for so deeply, and begged, Just one sign, Dorian. But there was nothing of her friend in that face. No hesitation or twinge of muscle against the attack as the prince lunged. Lunged, and then froze as he passed over the word mark she'd drawn on the ground with her foot, a quick and dirty mark to hold him. It wouldn't last for more than a few moments, but that was all she needed as he was forced to his knees, thrashing and pushing against the power, Aiden quietly swore. Aelin raised the Sword of Orinth over Dorian's head. One strike, just one to cleave through flesh and bone to spare him. The thing was roaring with a voice that didn't belong to Dorian, in a language that did not belong in this world. The mark on the ground flared, but held. Dorian looked up at her, such hatred on his beautiful face, such malice and rage. For Tarasin, for their future, she could do this. 
She could end this threat here and now, end him on his birthday, not a day past 20. She would suffer for it later, grieve later. Not one more name would she etch into her flesh, she'd promised herself. But for her kingdom, the blade dipped as she decided, and impact slammed into her father's sword, knocking her off balance as Aiden shouted. The arrow ricocheted into the garden, hissing against the gravel as it landed. Nezrin was already approaching. Another arrow drawn, pointed at Aiden. Strike the prince, and I'll shoot the general. Dorian let out a lover's laugh. You're a shit spy, Aelin snapped to her. You didn't even try to remain hidden when you watched me inside. Arab and Hamel told the captain you were going to try to kill the prince today, Nezrin said. Put your sword down. Aelin ignored the command. Nezrin's father makes the best pear tarts in the capital. She supposed Arabin had tried to warn her, and she'd been too distracted by everything else to contemplate the veiled message. Stupid. So profoundly stupid of her. Only seconds left before the wards failed. You lied to us, Nezrin said. The arrow remained pointed at Aiden, who was sizing up Nezrin, his hands curling as if he were imagining his fingers wrapped around her throat. You and Kaol are fools, Aelin said, even as part of her heaved in relief, even as she wanted to admit that what she had been about to do made her a fool as well. Aelin lowered the sword to her side. The thing inside Dorian hissed at her. You will regret this moment, girl. Aelin just whispered, I know. Aelin didn't give a shit what happened to Nezrin. She sheathed the sword, grabbed Aiden, and ran. Aiden's breath was like shards of glass in his lungs, but the blood-covered woman, Aelin, was tucking him along, cursing at him for being so slow. The garden was enormous, and shouts rose over the hedges behind them, closing in. Then they were at a stone wall already word-marked in blood, and there were strong hands reaching down to help him up and over. He tried to tell her to go first, but she was shoving at his back and then his legs, pushing him up as the two men atop the wall grunted with his weight. The wound in his ribs stretched and burned in agony. The world grew bright and spun as the hooded men eased him down to the quiet city street on the other side. He had to brace a hand against the wall to keep from slipping in the pooled blood of the downed royal guards beneath. He recognized none of their faces, some still set in silent screams. There was the hiss of a body on stone, and then his cousin swung down beside him, wrapping her grey cloak around her bloody costume, slinging the hood over her blood-spattered face. She had another cloak in her hands, courtesy of the wall patrol. He could hardly stand upright as she wrapped it around him and shoved the hood over his head. Run, she said. The two men atop the wall remained there, bows groaning as they were drawn, no sign of the young archer from the garden. Aiden stumbled, and Aelin swore, darting back to wrap an arm around his middle, and damn his strength for failing him now, he put his arm around her shoulders, leaning on her as they hurried down the too quiet residential street. Shouts were now erupting behind, accented by the whiz and thud of arrows and the bleeding of dying men. Four blocks, she panted, just four blocks. That didn't seem nearly far enough away to be safe, but he had no breath to tell her. Keeping upright was a task enough. The stitches in his side had split, but holy gods, they'd cleared the palace grounds. A miracle. A miracle. A mi Hurry, you hulking ass, she barked. Aiden forced himself to focus and willed strength into his legs, to his spine. They reached a street corner bedecked in streamers and flowers, and Aelin glanced in either direction before rushing through the intersection. The clash of steel on steel and the screams of wounded men shattered through the city, setting the throngs of merry-faced revelers around them, murmuring. But Aelin continued down the street, and then down another. At the third, she slowed her steps and rocked into him, beginning to sing a body tune in a very off-key, drunken voice. And thus they became two ordinary citizens out to celebrate the prince's birthday, staggering from one tavern to the next. No one paid them any heed, not when all eyes were fixed on the glass castle towering behind them. The swaying made his head spin. If he fainted, one more block, she promised. This was all some hallucination. It had to be. No one would actually have been stupid enough to try to rescue him, and especially not his own queen, even if he'd seen her cut down half a dozen men like so many stalks of wheat. Come on, come on, she panted, scanning the decorated street, and he knew she wasn't talking to him. People were milling about, pausing to ask what the palace commotion was about. Aelin led them through the crowd, mere cloaked and stumbling drunks, right up to the black carriage for hire that pulled along the curb as though it had been waiting. The door sprang open. His cousin shoved him inside, right onto the floor, and shut the door behind her.
They're already stopping every carriage at the major intersections, Lysandra said as Aelin pried open the hidden luggage compartment beneath one of the benches. It was big enough to fit a very tightly curled person, but Aiden was absolutely massive and in. Get in now, she ordered, and didn't wait for Aiden to move before she heaved him into the compartment. He groaned. Blood had started seeping from his side, but he'd live. That is, if any of them lived through the next few minutes. Aelin shut the panel beneath the cushion, wincing at the thud of wood on flesh, and grabbed the wet rag Lysandra had pulled from a hat box. Are you hurt? Lysandra asked as the carriage started into a leisurely pace through the reveler clogged streets. Aelin's heart was pounding so wildly that she thought she would vomit, but she shook her head as she wiped her face. So much blood. Then the remnants of her makeup. Then more blood. Lysandra handed her a second rag to wipe down her chest, neck, and hands, and then held out the loose, long-sleeved green dress she'd brought. Now, 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 Lysandra breathed. Aelin ripped her bloodied cloak away and tossed it to Lysandra, who rose to shove it into the compartment beneath her own seat as Aelin shimmied into the dress. Lysandra's fingers were surprisingly steady as she buttoned up the back, then made quick work of Aelin's hair, handed her a pair of gloves, and slung a jeweled necklace around her throat. A fan was pressed into her hands the moment the gloves were on, concealing any trace of blood. The carriage halted at the sound of harsh male voices. Lysander had just rolled up the curtains when stomping steps approached, followed by four of the king's guard peering into the carriage with sharp, merciless eyes. Lysander thrust open the window. Why are we being stopped? The guard yanked open the door and stuck his head in. Aelin noticed a smudge of blood on the floor, a moment before he did, and flinched back, covering it with her skirts. Sir! Lysander cried. An explanation is necessary at once. Aelin waved her fan with the lady's horror, praying that her cousin kept quiet in his little compartment. On the street beyond, some revelers had paused to watch the inspection, wide-eyed, curious, and not at all inclined to help the two women inside the carriage. The guard looked over them with a sneer, the expression deepening as his eyes alighted on Lysander's tattooed wrist. I owe you nothing, whore. He spat out another filthy word at both of them and then shouted, Search the compartment in the back. We are on our way to an appointment, Lysandra hissed, but he slammed the door in her face. The carriage jostled as the men leaped onto the back and opened the rear compartment. After a moment, someone slammed a hand on the side of the carriage and shouted, Move on! They didn't dare stop looking offended, didn't dare stop fanning themselves for the next two blocks, or the two after that, until the driver thumped on the top of the carriage twice. All clear. Aelin jumped off the bench and flung open the compartment. Aiden had vomited, but he was awake and looking more than a bit put out as she beckoned him to emerge. One more stop, then we're there. Quick, Lysander said, peering casually out the window. The others are almost here. The alley was barely wide enough to fit both carriages that ambled toward each other, no more than two large vehicles slowing to avoid colliding as they passed. Lysander flung open the door just as they were aligned with the other carriage, and Kale's tight face appeared across the way as he did the same. Go, 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 she said to Aiden, shoving him over the small gap between the coaches. He stumbled, grunting, as he landed against the captain. Lysander said behind her, I'll be there soon. Good luck. Aelin leaped into the other carriage, shutting the door behind her, and they continued on down the street. She was breathing so hard that she thought she'd never get enough air. Aiden slumped onto the floor, keeping low. Kale said, everything all right? She could only manage a nod, grateful he didn't push for any other answers. But it wasn't all right, not at all. The carriage, driven by one of Kale's men, took them another few blocks, right to the border of the slums, where they got out on a deserted, decrepit street. She trusted Kale's men, but only so far. Taking Aiden right to her apartment seemed like asking for trouble. With Aiden sagging between them, she and Kale hurried down the next several blocks, taking the long way back to the warehouse to dodge any tail, listening so hard they barely breathed. But then they were at the warehouse, and Aiden managed to stand long enough for Kale to slide the door open before they rushed inside, into the dark and safety at last. Kale took Aelin's place at Aiden's side as she lingered by the door, Grunting at the weight, he managed to get her cousin up the stairs. He's got an injury along his ribs, she said, as he forced herself to wait, to monitor the warehouse door for any signs of pursuers. It's bleeding. Kale gave her a confirming nod over his shoulder. When her cousin and the captain were almost at the top of the stairs, when it became clear no one was about to burst in, she followed them. But pausing had cost her. Pausing had let the razor-sharp focus slip, let every thought she'd kept at bay come sweeping in. Every step she took was heavier than the last. One foot up, then the next, then the next. 
By the time she made it to the second floor, Kale had taken Aiden into the guest bedroom. The sound of running water gurgled out to greet her. Aelin left the front door unlocked for Lysandra, and for a moment she just stood in her apartment, bracing a hand on the back of the couch, staring at nothing. When she was certain she could move again, she strode into her bedroom. She was naked before she reached the bathing chamber, and she sat herself right in the cold, dry tub before she turned on the water. Once she emerged, clean and wearing one of Sam's old white shirts and a pair of his undershorts, Kale was waiting for her on the couch. She didn't dare look at his face. Not yet. Lysandra popped her head in from the guest room. I'm just finishing cleaning him up. He should be fine. If he doesn't burst the stitches again. No infection, thank the gods. Aelin lifted a limp hand in thanks, also not daring to look into the room behind Lysandra to see the massive figure lying on the bed, a towel around his waist. If Kale and the courtesan had been introduced, she didn't particularly care. There was no good place to have this talk with Kale, so she just stood in the center of the room and watched as the captain rose from his seat, his shoulders tight. What happened? he demanded. She swallowed once. I killed a lot of people today. I'm not in the mood to analyze it. That's never bothered you before. She couldn't dredge up the energy to even feel the sting of the words. The next time you decide you don't trust me, try not to prove it at a time when my life or Aiden's is on the line. A flash of his bronze eyes told her he'd somehow already seen Nezrin. Kale's voice was hard and cold as ice as he said, You tried to kill him. You said you'd try to get him out to help him and you tried to kill him. The bedroom where Lysandra was working had gone silent. Aelin let out a low snarl. You want to know what I did? I gave him one minute. I gave up one minute of my escape to him. Do you understand what can happen in one minute? Because I gave up one to Dorian when he attacked Aiden and me today to capture us. I gave him a minute in which the fate of my entire kingdom could have changed forever. I chose the son of my enemy. He gripped the back of the sofa as though physically restraining himself. You're a liar. You've always been a liar. And today was no exception. You had a sword over his head. I did, she spat, and before Felique arrived to wreck everything, I was going to do it. I should have done it, as anyone with common sense would have, because Dorian is gone. And there was her breaking heart, fracturing at the monster she'd seen living in Dorian's eyes, the demon that would hunt her and Aiden down and would stalk her dreams. I do not owe you an apology, she said to Kaol. Don't talk down to me like you're my queen, he snapped. No, I'm not your queen. But you are going to have to decide soon whom you serve, because the Dorian you knew is gone forever. A darling's future does not depend on him anymore. The agony in Kaol's eyes hit her like a physical blow, and she wished she had mastered herself better when explaining it, but she needed him to understand the risk she'd taken, and the danger she'd let Arabin manipulate him into putting her in. He had to know that there was a hard line that she must draw, and that she would hold, to protect her own people. So she said, Go to the roof and take first watch. Kale blinked. I'm not your queen, but I'm going to attend to my cousin right now, and since I hope Nezrin is lying low, someone needs to take the watch, unless you'd like for us all to be caught unawares by the king's men. Kale didn't bother replying as he turned on his heel and strode out. She listened to him storming up the stairs and onto the roof, and it was only then that she loosed a breath and scrubbed at her face. When she lowered her hands, Lysandra was standing in the guest bedroom doorway, her eyes wide. What do you mean, queen? Aelin winced, swearing under her breath. That's exactly the word I'd use, Lysandra said, her face pale. Aelin said, my name, oh, I know what your real name is, Aelin. Shit. You understand why I had to keep it a secret? Of course I do, Lysandra said, pursing her lips. You don't know me, and more lives than yours are at stake. No, I do know you. Gods, why were the words so damn hard to get out? The longer the hurt flickered in Lysandra's eyes, the wider the gap across the room felt. Aelin swallowed. Until I had Aiden back, I wasn't going to take any chances. I knew I would have to tell you the moment you saw us in a room together. And Arabin knows. Those green eyes were hard as chips of ice. He's always known. This, this changes nothing between us. You know nothing. Lysandra glanced behind her, to the bedroom where Aiden now lay unconscious and loosed a long breath. The resemblance is uncanny. Gods, the fact that you went undiscovered for so many years boggles the mind. She studied Aiden again. Even though he's a handsome bastard, it'd be like kissing you. Her eyes were still hard, but a flicker of amusement gleamed there. Aelin grimaced. I could have lived without knowing that. She shook her head. I don't know why I was ever nervous you would start bowing and scraping. Light and understanding danced in Lysandra's eyes. Where would the fun be in that? 
Chapter 20 Several days after running into the wing leader, Halid Loken's ankle was sore, her lower back a tight knot, and her shoulders aching as she took the last step into the airy. At least she'd made it without encountering any horrors in the halls, though the climb had nearly killed her. She hadn't grown accustomed to the steep, endless steps of Morath in the two months since she'd been dragged into this horrible place by Vernon. Just completing her daily tasks made her ruined ankle throb with pain she hadn't experienced in years, and today was the worst yet. She would have to scrounge up some herbs from the kitchen tonight to soak her foot, maybe even some oils if the ornery cook was feeling generous enough. Compared with some of the other Denzians of Morath, he was fairly mild. He tolerated her presence in the kitchen and her requests for herbs, especially when she oh-so-sweetly offered to clean a few dishes or prepare meals. And he never blinked twice when she inquired about when the next shipment of food and supplies would come in, because, oh, she'd loved his whatever fruit pie, and it would be so nice to have it again. Easy to flatter, easy to trick. Making people see and hear what they wanted to, one of the many weapons in her arsenal. A gift from Aneath, the Lady of the Wise Things. Fanula had claimed, the only gift Alid often thought that she'd ever received beyond her old nursemaid's good heart and wits. She'd never told Finula that she often prayed to the clever goddess to bestow another gift on those who made the years in Paranth a living hell, death, and not the gentle sort. Not like Silba, who offered peaceful ends, or Hellas, who offered violent burning ones. No, deaths at Aneath's hands, at the hands of Hellas' consort, were brutal, bloody, and slow. The kind of death Elite expected to receive at any moment these days, from the witches who prowled the halls, or from the dark-eyed duke, his lethal soldiers, or the white-haired wingleader who tasted her blood like fine wine. She'd had nightmares about it ever since. That is, when she could sleep at all. Elite had needed to rest twice on her way to the airy, and her limp was deep by the time she reached the top of the tower, bracing herself for the beasts and the monsters who wrote them. An urgent message had come for the wingleader while Elite was cleaning her room. And when Elite explained that the wing leader was not there, the man heaved a sigh of relief, shoved the letter in Elite's hand, and said to find her. And then the man had run. She should have suspected it. It had taken two heartbeats to note and catalogue the man's details, his tells, and ticks. Sweaty, his face pale, pupils dilated, he'd sagged at the sight of Elite when she opened the door. Bastard. Most men, she decided, were bastards of varying degrees. Most of them were monsters. None worse than Vernon. Elite scanned the airy, empty, not even a handler to be seen. The hay floor was fresh, the feeding troughs full of meat and grain, but the food was untouched by the wyverns whose massive leathery bodies loomed beyond the archways, perched on wooden beams jutting over the plunge as they surveyed the keep and the army below like thirteen mighty lords. Limping as close as she dared to one of the massive openings, Elite peered out at the view. It was exactly as the wing leader's map had depicted it in the spare moments when she could sneak a look. They were surrounded by ashy mountains, and though she'd been in a prison wagon for the long journey here, she had taken note of the forest she'd spied at the distance and the rushing of the massive river they had passed days before they ascended the broad, rocky mountain road. In the middle of nowhere, that's where Marath was, and the view before her confirmed it. No cities, no towns, and an entire army surrounding her. She shoved back the despair that crept into her veins. She had never seen an army before coming here. Soldiers, yes, but she'd been eight when her father passed her up onto Vernon's horse and kissed her goodbye, promising to see her soon. She hadn't been in Ornith to witness the army that seized its riches, its people, and she'd been locked in a tower in Peranth Castle by the time the army reached her family's lands and her uncle became the king's ever-faithful servant and stole her father's title. Her title. Lady of Paranth. That's what she should have been. Not that it mattered now. There wasn't much of Terrison's court left to belong to. None of them had come for her in those initial months of slaughter, and in the years since, none had remembered that she'd existed. Perhaps they assumed she was dead, like Aelin, that wild queen who might have been. Perhaps they were all dead themselves, and maybe, given the dark army now spread before her, that was a mercy. Elide gazed across the flickering lights of the war camp, and a chill went down her spine. An army to crush whatever resistance Fanula had once whispered about during the long nights when they were locked in that tower in Paranth. Perhaps the white-haired wing leader herself would lead that army, on the wyvern with the shimmering wings. A fierce, cool wind blew into the airy, and Elide leaned into it, gulping it down as if it were fresh water. There had been so many nights in Paranth when only the wailing wind had kept her company. When she could have sworn it sang ancient songs to lull her to sleep. 
Here, here the wind was a colder, sleeker thing, serpentine almost. Entertaining such fanciful things will only distract you, Fanula would have chided. She wished her nurse were here, but wishing had done her no good these past ten years, and a lead, Lady of Paranth, had no one coming for her. Soon, she reassured herself, soon the next caravan of supplies would crawl up the mountain road, and when it went back down, a lead would be stowed away in one of the wagons, free at long last, and then she would run somewhere far away, where they'd never even heard of Terrasin or Darlin, and leave these people to their miserable continent. A few weeks, then she might stand a chance of escaping. If she survived until then, if Vernon didn't decide he truly did have some wicked purpose in dragging her here, if she didn't wind up with those poor people caged inside the surrounding mountains, screaming for salvation every night. She'd overheard the other servants whisper about the dark, fell things that went on under those mountains. People being splayed open on black stone altars and then forged into something new, something other. For what wretched purpose, Elide had not yet learned, and mercifully, beyond the screaming, she'd never encountered whatever was being broken and pieced together beneath the earth. The witches were bad enough. Elide shuddered as she took another step into the vast chamber. The crunching of hay under her two small shoes and the clank of her chains were the only sounds. W wingly A roar blasted through the air, the stones, the floor, so loud that she her head swam and she cried out, tumbling back, her chains tangled as she slipped on the hay. Hard, iron-tipped hands dug into her shoulders and kept her upright. "'If you are not a spy,' a wicked voice purred in her ear, "'then why are you here, Elide Loken?' Elide wasn't faking it when her hand shook as she held out the letter, not daring to move. The wing leader stepped around her, circling Elide like prey, her long white braid stark against her flying leather gear. The details hit Elide like stones, eyes like burnt gold, a face so impossibly beautiful that Elide was struck dumb by it, a lean, honed body, and a steady, fluid grace in every movement, every breath, that suggested the wing leader could easily use an assortment of blades on her, human only in shape, immortal and predatory in every other sense. Fortunately, the wing leader was alone. Unfortunately, those gold eyes held nothing but death. Elite said, Th This came for you. The stammer. That was faked. People usually couldn't wait to get away when she stammered and stuttered though she doubted the people who ran this place would care about the stammer if they decided to have some fun with that daughter of Terrison, if Vernon handed her over. The wing leader held Elide's gaze as she took the letter. I'm surprised the seal isn't broken, though if you were a good spy, you would know how to do it without breaking the wax. If I were a good spy, Elide breathed, I could also read. A bit of truth to temper the witch's distrust. The witch blinked and then sniffed as if trying to detect a lie. You speak well for a mortal, and your uncle is a lord, yet you cannot read? Elide nodded. More than the leg, more than the drudgery, it was that miserable shortcoming that hounded her. Her nurse, Fenula, couldn't read, but Fenula had been the one to teach her how to take notes of things, to listen, and to think. During the long days, when they'd had nothing to do but needlepoint, her nurse had taught her to mark the little details, each stitch, while also never losing sight of the larger image. There will come a day when I am gone, Elide, and you will need to have every weapon in your arsenal sharp and ready to strike. Neither of them had thought that Elide might be the one who left first, but she would not look back, not even for Fenula, once she ran. And when she found that new life, that new place, she would never gaze northward to Terrasin and wonder either. She kept her eyes on the ground. I, I know my basic letters, but my lesson stopped when I was eight. At your uncle's behest, I assume? The witch paused, rotating the envelope and showing the jumble of letters to her, tapping on them with an iron nail. This says Manon Blackbeak. You see anything like this? Bring it to me. Elide bowed her head, meek, submissive, just the way these witches like their humans. Of, of course. And why don't you stop pretending to be a stammering, cowering wretch while you're at it? Elide kept her head bent low enough that her hair hopefully covered any glimmer of surprise. I've tried to be pleasing. I smelled your human fingers all over my map. It was careful, cunning work, not to put one thing out of order, not to touch anything but the map. Thinking of escaping, after all? Uh, of course not, mistress. Oh, gods, she was so, so dead. Look at me. Elide obeyed. The witch hissed, and Elide flinched as she shoved Elide's hair out of her eyes. A few strands fell to the ground, sliced off by the iron nails. 
I don't know what game you're playing. If you're a spy, if you're a thief, if you're just looking out for yourself, but do not pretend that you were some meek, pathetic little girl when I can see that vicious mind working behind your eyes. Ali didn't dare drop the mask. Was it your mother or father who was related to Vernon? Strange question, but Aline had known for a while she would do anything, say anything, to stay alive and unharmed. My father was Vernon's elder brother, she said. And where did your mother come from? She didn't give that old grief an inch of room in her heart. She was lowborn, a laundress. Where did she come from? Why did it matter? The golden eyes fixed on her, unyielding. Her family was originally from Rosamel, in the northwest of Terrasin. I know where it is. Alid kept her shoulders bowed, waiting. Get out. Hiding her relief, Alid opened her mouth to make her goodbyes when another roar set the stones vibrating. She couldn't conceal her flinch. It's just a Braxos, Manon said, a hint of a smile forming on her cruel mouth, a bit of light gleaming in those golden eyes. Her mount must make her happy then, if witches could be happy. He's hungry. Alid's mount went dry. At the sound of his name, a massive triangular head, scarred badly around one eye, poked into the airy. Elite's knees wobbled, but the witch went right up to the beast and placed her iron-tipped hands on its snout. You swine, the witch said. You need the whole mountain to know you're hungry? The wyvern huffed into her hands, his giant teeth. Oh god, some of them were iron. So close to Manon's arm. One bite and the wing leader would be dead. One bite, and yet... The wyvern's eyes lifted and met Elite's. Not looked at, but met, as if... Elid kept perfectly still, even though every instinct was roaring at her to run for the stairs. The wyvern nudged past Manon, the floor shuddering beneath him, and sniffed in Elid's direction. Then those giant, depthless eyes moved down to her legs. No, to the chain. There were so many scars all over him, so many brutal lines. She did not think Manon had made them, not with the way she spoke to him. Abraxos was smaller than the others, she realized. Far smaller. And yet the wing leader had picked him. Elid tucked that information away, too. If Manon had a soft spot for broken things, perhaps she would spare her as well. Abraxos lowered himself to the ground, stretching out his neck until his head rested on the hay not ten feet from Elid. Those giant black eyes stared up at her, almost dog-like. Enough, Abraxos, Manon hissed, grabbing a saddle from the rack by the wall. How do they... exist? Elid breathed. She'd heard stories of wyverns and dragons, and she remembered glimpses of the little folk in the fae, but Manon hauled the leather saddle over to her mount. The king made them. I don't know how, and it doesn't matter. The king of Adarlan made them? Like whatever was being made inside those mountains. The man who had shattered her life, murdered her parents, doomed her to this. Don't be angry, Fanula had said. Be smart. And soon the king and his miserable empire wouldn't be her concern anyway. Elid said, Your mount doesn't seem evil. Abraxos's tail thumped on the ground, the iron spikes in it glinting, a giant, lethal dog, with wings. Manon huffed a cold laugh, strapping the saddle into place. No, however he was made, something went wrong with that part. Elid didn't think that constituted going wrong, but kept her mouth shut. Abraxos was still staring up at her, and the wing leader said, Let's go hunt, Abraxos. The beast perked up, and Elid jumped back a step, wincing as she landed hard on her ankle. The wyvern's eyes shot to her, as if aware of the pain, but the wing leader was already finishing with the saddle and didn't bother to look in her direction as Elid limped out. You soft-hearted worm, Manon hissed at Abraxos once the cunning many-faced girl was gone. The girl might be hiding secrets, but her lineage wasn't one of them. She had no idea that witch blood flowed strong in her mortal veins. A crippled leg and a few chains, and you're in love? Abraxos nudged her with his snout, and Manon gave him a firm but gentle slap before leaning against his warm hide and ripping open the letter addressed in her grandmother's handwriting. Just like the high witch of the Black Beak clan, it was brutal, to the point, and unforgiving. Do not disobey the duke's orders. Do not question him. If there is another letter from Marath about your disobedience, I will fly down there myself and hang you by your intestines, with your thirteen and that runt of a beast beside you. Three yellow legs and two blue blood covens are arriving tomorrow. See to it that there are no fights or trouble. I do not need other matrons breathing down my neck about their vermin. Manon turned the paper over, but that was it. Crunching it in a fist, she sighed. Abraxos nudged at her again, and she idly stroked his head. Maid, maid, 
made. That was what the Cochin had said before Manon slit her throat. You were made into monsters. She tried to forget it, tried to tell herself that the Cochin had been a fanatic and a preachy twat, but she ran a finger down the deep red cloth of her cloak. Made, made, made. Manon climbed into the saddle and was glad to lose herself in the sky. Tell me about the Vogue, Manon said, shutting the door to the small chamber behind her. Ghislaine didn't look up from the book she was poring over. There was a stack of them on the desk before her, and another beside the narrow bed, where the eldest and cleverest of her thirteen had gotten them from, who she'd likely gutted to steal them, Manon didn't care. Hello, and come right in, why don't you, was the response. Manon leaned against the door and crossed her arms. Only books, only when reading, was Ghislaine so snappish. On the battlefield, in the air, the dark-skinned witch was quiet, easy to command. A solid soldier, made more valuable by her razor-sharp intelligence, which had earned her spot among the thirteen. Ghislaine shut the book and twisted in her seat. Her black curly hair was braided back, but even the plate couldn't keep it entirely contained. She narrowed her sea-green eyes, the shame of her mother, as there wasn't a trace of gold in them. Why would you want to know about the Valg? Do you know about them? Ghislaine pivoted in her chair until she was sitting backward on it, her legs straddling the sides. She was in her flying leathers, as if she couldn't be bothered to remove them before falling into one of her books. Of course I know about the Valg, she said, with a wave of her hand, an impatient, mortal gesture. It had been an exception, an unprecedented exception, when Ghislaine's mother had convinced the High Witch to send her daughter to a mortal school in Terrasin a hundred years ago. She had learned magic and book things and whatever else mortals were taught, and when Ghislaine had returned twelve years later, the witch had been different. Still a black beak, still bloodthirsty, but somehow more human, even now, a century later, even after walking on and off killing fields, that sense of impatience, of life, clung to her. Manon had never known what to make of it. Tell me everything. There's too much to tell you in one sitting, Ghislaine said, but I'll give you the basics. If you want more, you can come back. An order, but this was Ghislaine's space, and books and knowledge were her domain. Manon motioned with an iron-tipped hand for her sentinel to go on. Millennia ago, when the Valg broke into our world, witches did not exist. It was the Valg and the Fae and humans. But the Valg were demons, I suppose. They wanted our world for their own, and they thought a good way to get it would be to ensure that their offspring could survive here. The humans weren't compatible, too breakable. But the Fae... The Valg kidnapped and stole whatever fay they could, and because your eyes are getting that glazed look, I'm just going to jump to the end and say the offspring became us. Witches. The Iron Teeth took after our Valg ancestors more, while the Crochins got more of the fay traits. The people of these lands didn't want us here, not after the war, but the Fae King Brandon didn't think it was right to hunt us all down. So he gave us the Western Waste, and there we went, until the Witch Wars made us exiles again. Manon picked out her nails. And the Valg are... wicked? We are wicked, Ghislaine said. The Valg? Legend has it that they are the origin of evil. They are blackness and despair incarnate. Sounds like our kind of people. And maybe good ones, indeed, to ally with, to breed with. But Ghislaine's smile faded. No, she said softly. No, I do not think they would be our kind of people at all. They have no laws, no codes. They would see the Thirteen as weak for our bonds and rules, as something to break for amusement. Manon stiffened slightly. And if the Valg were ever to return here? Brandon and the Fae Queen Maeve found ways to defeat them, to send them back. I would hope that someone would find a way to do it again. More to think about. She turned, but Ghislaine said, That's the smell, isn't it? The smell here, around some of the soldiers, like it's wrong, from another world. The king found some way to bring them here and stuff them into human bodies. She hadn't thought that far, but the duke described them as allies. That word does not exist with the Valg. They find the alliance useful, but will honor it only as long as it remains that way. Manon debated the merits of ending the conversation there, but said, The Duke asked me to pick a black beak coven for them to experiment on, to allow him to insert some sort of stone into their bellies that will create a Valg iron teeth child. Slowly, Ghislaine straightened, her ink splattered hands hanging slack on either side of her chair. And do you plan to obey, lady? Not a question from a scholar to a curious student, but from a sentinel to her heir. 
The High Witch has given the orders to obey the Duke's every command. But maybe, maybe she would write her grandmother another letter. Who will you pick? Manon opens the door. I don't know. My decision is due in two days. Elaine, who Manon had seen glut herself on the blood of men, had paled by the time Manon shut the door. Manon didn't know how, didn't know if the guards or the duke or Vernon or some eavesdropping human filth said something, but the next morning, the witches all knew. She knew better than to suspect Ghislaine. None of her thirteen talked, ever. But everyone knew about the Valg and Manon's choice. She strode into the dining hall, its black arches glinting in the rare morning sun. Already the pounding of the forges was ringing out in the valley below, made louder by the silence that fell as she strode between the tables, heading for her seat at the front of the room. Coven after coven watched, and she met their gazes, teeth out and nails drawn, sorrel a steady force of nature at her back. It wasn't until Manon slid into her place beside Astrin, and realized it was now the wrong place but didn't move, that chatter resumed in the hall. She pulled a hunk of bread toward her but didn't touch it. None of them ate the food. Breakfast and dinner were always for show, to have a presence here. The thirteen didn't say a word. Manon stared at each and every one of them down, until they dropped their eyes. But when their gaze met Astrin's, the witch held it. Do you have something you want to say? Manon said to her. Or do you just want to start swinging? Astrin's eyes flicked over Manon's shoulder. We have guests. Manon found the leader of one of the newly arrived Yellow Legs covens standing at the foot of the table, eyes downcast, posture unthreatening. Complete submission. What? Manon demanded. The coven leader kept her head low. We would request your consideration for the duke's task, wing leader. Astrin stiffened, along with many of the thirteen. The nearby tables had also gone silent. And why? Manon asked. Would you want to do that? You will force us to do your drudgery work, to keep us from glory on the killing fields. That is the way of our clans. But we might win a different sort of glory in this way. Manon held in her sigh, weighing, contemplating. I will consider it. The coven leader bowed and backed away. Manon couldn't decide whether she was a fool or cunning or brave. None of the thirteen spoke for the rest of breakfast. And what coven, wing leader, have you selected for me? Manon met the duke's stare. A coven of yellow legs under a witch named Ninya arrived earlier this week. Use them. I wanted black beaks. You're getting yellow legs, Manon snapped. Down the table, Kaltain did not react. They volunteered. Better than black beaks, she told herself. Better than that the yellow legs had offered themselves, even if Manon could have refused them. She doubted Ghislaine was wrong about the nature of the Valg, but maybe this could work to their advantage, depending on how the yellow legs fared. The duke flashed his yellowing teeth. You tow a dangerous line, wing leader. All witches have to, in order to fly wyverns. Vernon leaned forward. These wild, immortal things are so diverting, your grace. Manon gave him a long, long look that told Vernon that one day, in a shadowy hallway, he would find himself with the claws of this wild, immortal thing in his belly. Manon turned to go. Sorrel, not Astrin, stood stone-faced by the door, another jarring sight. Then Manon turned back to the duke the question forming, even as she willed herself not to say it. To what end? Why do all of this? Why ally with the Valg? Why raise this army? Why? She could not understand it. The continent already belonged to them. It made no sense. Because we can, the Duke said simply. And because this world has too long dwelled in ignorance and archaic tradition, it is time to see what might be improved. Manon made a show of contemplating and then nodding as she strode out. But she had not missed the words, this world, not this land, not this continent, this world. She wondered whether her grandmother had considered the idea that they might one day have to fight to keep the wastes, fight the very men who had helped them take back their home, and wondered what would become of these Valg iron-teeth witchlings in that world. <laughs>